Resources Committee of East Bay Regional Park District. And uh, it is 1230-ish and it's September 7th, 2022. Uh, welcome to people. We um, are going to um, do a roll call first, Sabrina. Yes, Director Lane. Here. Director Coffey. Here. Director Corbett. Here. All right, and are there some other people we need to indicate? Yes. For? Assistant General Manager, Christina Kelchner. She's, she's here and muted. And then um, Chief of Stewardship, Matt Growl. I think he's just coming on now. All right, welcome to both of you uh, and all of you who are here. Uh, today's meeting is held virtually pursuant to the Brown Act and AB 361. Board members and staff <laughs> may participate uh, via phone and video conferencing. Um, we are all virtual today. So we're providing live audio and video streaming <clears throat> and pro have provided the public the opportunity to email or call in, call in prior to the meeting uh, for public con comment. All information regarding participation in this meeting can be uh, viewed on the agenda on the district website, ebparks.org. We will take public comment after each presentation. So are there any questions about this uh, from the committee? No. Okay, not seeing any. Um, Sabrina, do you wanna say something about people doing public comment uh, at this time? Should we just send them to you? Um, I, I can just, um, I can go over how public comment was submitted, um, the three ways that you could submit public comment for this meeting. Would you um, do that please? Okay, I will do so, thank you, Director Lane. The first way was via email to naturalcultural at ebparks.org, email. <laughs> or voicemail to 510-544-2651 or live via Zoom at this link um, during the meeting. We will set a time as Director Lane said at the end of this meeting for public comment as well as after each presentation. So if you would like, if you're on the live Zoom call and you would like to speak, please um, let us know, send me a chat message and raise your hand at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that. Our first um, agenda item is nature check, understanding wildlife health on East Bay lands. So we're gonna have a presentation from ecological services manager, Becky Tudin and wildlife program um, manager, Doug Bell. And is, is Tudin the way to pronounce that? It is. Thank oh, you. Good, good guess. <laughs> All right, so please proceed. Let me share my screen. Um, how's that? I don't see anything yet. Hmm. Still nothing? Nothing. Well, I did share screen. I shared the screen. <clears throat> How's that? Here we go. Yes. So it, it doesn't fill up everything, but it's there. There you go. There we are. Is that, the, is that the correct one? Sorry about that. Is that the yes. view? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, welcome. My name is Becky Tudin. I'm the Ecological Services Manager, and I will be co-presenting with Doug Bell on Nature Check uh, and 
I'm very pleased to be here in front of the Natural Cultural Resources Committee. Um, as you may recall, we came in front of the board just about a year ago um, and gave an update on the ecological health assessment and Director Lane, you wisely suggested that we come up with a new name and we did, it's called Nature Check. So throughout this presentation, um, we can refer to it interchangeably as either Nature Check or the ecological health assessment. Um, and we completed this report in May of this year. Uh, and uh, just so you know, this report only covered wildlife. Uh, we will have a future report on uh, vegetation, a nature check report on vegetation that we will be using the fine scale vegetation map and fuels mapping effort that is underway to help inform that report. Uh, so I'm gonna walk you through the framework just one more time, um, just as a refresher, and then Doug Bell uh, will come and discuss the results that we got from the report. Now, I know you had a discussion about the logo and what animals, yes, et cetera, would appear. And so what are the ones that we have? So the ones on the logo um, are, there's a golden eagle flying, and there's a bobcat who's a maze of carnivore, which is covered in our study. Uh, there's a ground squirrel, which is a keystone species, although many people think it's just a nuisance, but um, Doug will explain why we included it. And then there is an amphibian, a newt, which is included in our um, amphibian and reptile diversity index. All right, thank you. And, and I, Doug is probably gonna kick me, but the golden eagle is also one of our indicator species. So. Okay. Uh, Thank so you. why why did we do this? Um, it's always best management practices to assess the natural resources um, so that you can uh, inform your management. But it's also consistent um, and in line with our park district master plan goals to monitor the health and viability of our natural resources and also to coordinate with other agencies on that. Um, so what we did to start the ecological health assessment was we reached out to our partners uh, and we collaborated with the four largest land managers in Alameda and Contra Costa County, California State Parks, East Bay Municipal Utility District, Contra Costa Water District, um, and the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And together we collectively manage over 225,000 acres in those two counties which is roughly 25% of the total area of those counties. Um, and it's also approaching the 30%, um, which is the goal in the governor's 30 by 30 initiative, which is looking to conserve 30% of the lands by 2030. And another point I wanna just make in working with our partners is it really was uh, the formation of the East Bay Stewardship Network. Um, Nature Check launched this effort and it was a beginning step in intentional management and collaboration across jurisdictional lines. So here is a map of the focus area, um, and you'll see that we have three subregions. Um, subregion one is the East Bay Hills, subregion two is the Mount Diablo Range, and subregion three is the Mount Hamilton Range. And each of the different colors represent the different landowners and the land they manage in that study area. And those three landscape units came from the Conservation Land Network, which is a project underneath Together Bay Area, which is another regional uh, effort to do collaboration for resource management. So we're really trying to build and capitalize on existing efforts. And across those three subregions, we did cover the same species with the same metrics, but we thought we could tease out some differences in how those species might be doing. The East Bay Hills tends to be a little bit cooler, perhaps more wooded, whereas the Eastern counties are drier. So, um, well, again, it's the same information. We might get different results by subregion. So what is an ecological health assessment? Uh, so what it does is it provides a framework uh, that uses existing data and allows us to create a baseline measurement of the ecological health of the region. And now that we've completed this baseline measurement, we can take that same measurement a few years from now and measure the health ongoing. So it would help us understand those resources and how they're faring in the place of climate change, increased development, and other stressors. 
So what we currently do is we gather data and we monitor efforts either through permit compliance or research permits or other reasons, but it's often on a site-specific basis and it's often individual species focused. So what this does is it pulls it all together across a landscape, um, not just site by site, and we're using the same species with the same metrics and thresholds across the landscape on a consistent and ongoing basis. So what I mean by metrics and thresholds, um, as an example that I always use, is we often, uh, we have multiple ways of measuring the health of the human body. We have blood pressure, cholesterol, oxygen level, temp temperatures. Um, and each of those metrics have different thresholds that tell you you're in good health, there's caution, or there's significant concern. So we did that exact same um, process of identifying metrics and threshold for our ecosystem taxa as a way of measuring our ecological health. Now note that in some cases we have less data or perhaps it was less clear what was the best metric to use. I want to note that we did um, run this by a scientific panel at a workshop and then also gave those same scientific experts an opportunity to review our chapters. So um, it really is uh, peer reviewed. Um, but it's not scientifically researched, um, statistically significant, but it is our best professional judgment. Um, and while there isn't a right answer, it's really gonna do a lot to help inform our management and uh, help us identify where our key data gaps are and how to best respond to the stressors. So the first thing that we do is we start by using indicators. So you cannot measure every single aspect of the environment, but you wanna measure those aspects that you think are important or reflective of the overall ecological health and measure those. So the taxa that we studied include fish, amphibians. Uh, we looked at the golden eagle as an iconic species. And then we also looked at a, a suite of bird species by habitat type. And then we looked at a range of mammals, both rare um, as well as keystone, like the ground squirrel, um, bats, puma, and other maze of carnivores. So we chose those because they were, we felt representative of the study area. We had information and data across the study area. And um, we also had sufficient data over time. And in this case, we went from roughly a 10 year period, 2009 to 2019. Uh, and, just to give you a little bit, I'm gonna walk you through one taxa and one metric so you can see how uh, we use those thresholds. So in this instance, it's the California red-legged red frog and amphibian that we chose as one of our indicator species. And the metrics we chose, there were four of them, presence, breeding, metapopulations, and then invasive species. And just looking at the one metric, um, the presence, we looked at the number of ponds occupied by the red-legged frog. And if that was maintained or increased, we said, that's good, it's in a healthy condition. If the number of occupied ponds declined by 10%, that's reason for caution. And if it declined by more than 20%, that's significant concern. So that's an example of one metric that we developed for one of our taxa. And we did the same process for multiple metrics for multiple taxa, and then we rolled it up to get an actual results. So um, this is the framework that we use to uh, kind of convey this complicated information to the public in a very simplistic way. First, we looked at the trend. How is it changing over time? In some cases, because this is the first report, the baseline report, we didn't necessarily have. Um, a trend that we could speak to, so then it would be unknown, but otherwise we would say the trend was improving, unchanging, or declining. And then for the condition, again, we're looking at the current state of the indicator using those metrics and those thresholds. Uh, is it good, caution, significant concern, or in some cases, we don't have enough data to say. And then I think what's what I really wanna note here is the confidence that we have in the data, how robust and how recent is the data. And given that um, we're, we're creating our own metrics based on best professional judgment, we wanted to be transparent about the amount of data that we had. Um, and we really had to push our experts 
um, on these highly complex ecological systems and try to get them to pare down to look at these metrics. Uh, so again, it's science driven and it's a better model than we currently have. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Doug Bell, the wildlife program manager to give you the results. Quick mask change. All right. There we go. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Becky. And uh, good afternoon, directors Corbett, Lane, and Coffee, as well as ladies and gentlemen. It really is a pleasure to speak to you this afternoon about this huge effort. Um, it, it basically, as, as Becky alluded to, it was a, it was a system-wide effort by the multiple sister agencies. But not just that, I mean, we pulled in experts from across the state to help inform the process, to help inform the process of developing metrics. Um, and even, even the, the indicator species that we wanted to look at. Um, so so it's, it really was a, a gigantic team effort, uh, both within the sister agencies, as well as um, beyond with all the experts that we pulled in. Um, so what I hope to do is, is just run through it's, um, the, a series of results and analyses that we, that we um, completed for the various organ, uh, taxa, animal groups that we looked at, um, but really it's, it's there's much more information to present than we have time here. So I would certainly advise you if you, if you have further interest um, to actually go to Nature Check itself, this volume that's available um, online. It's very thick and gives you a lot of really excellent detail. So let's drop into the fish um, first. And uh, we analyzed, um, if we look here at the, uh, the again, the, the, the three subregions: East Bay Hills, Mount Hamilton, Mount Diablo, um, we analyzed four watersheds for which we have really good data. Um, that would be Pinole Creek, Wildcat Creek, San Leandro Creek, and Alameda Creek. Um, unfortunately, um, and also pointing out the data gaps that this system is, that, that our methods have helped actually um, you know, make us aware of, of gaps in data that we need to collect uh, moving forward. The Mount Diablo region does not have um, great coverage as far as stream surveys go. Um, but anyway, so focusing on the four watersheds, uh, we chose for our metrics rainbow trout, otherwise also known as steelhead, that's an anadromous version of the rainbow trout, and then native fish diversity. Um, and one of the metrics was for um, trout, do we have a self-sustaining population in the watersheds? And by self-sustaining, that meant that in any given survey year where the stream was surveyed or at many of its tributaries, if you had three or more of the um, age classes present during those surveys, um, such as eggs, larvae, or juveniles, or adults. Um, that would certainly tell you you've got a healthy breeding population in that given stream reach, uh, passage, um, stream reach. And then we also looked at you know, how many streams have, have um, uh, impediments to passage, because again, the steelhead itself is an anadromous fish, um, and there's very few opportunities for it to get really up into the upper reaches of say Alameda Creek because there are impediments with dams and um, check dams and that sort of thing. So that factored into um, our metrics for the trout. And then we also looked at species diversity and abundance, um, uh, particularly looking at the percentage of native fish that would be present in the given stream relative to introduced fish like bass, bluegill, you name it, um, as well as their abundance. Um, so that's a lot of metrics, um, um, but fortunately we did have really good data on these four major stream complexes. Um, and just uh, to sort of summarize all of that, um, the significant stressors of course are still remaining fish, fish, pass, fish passages, um, um, uh, dams and again, check dams. Um, other stressors can, of course, anything related to water quality, um, you name it. I mean, fish are such good indicators of overall health of the aquatic system. Um, many are, you know, feeding on aquatic insects. Um, they also indicate, you know, the uh, overall level of uh, riparian diversity and habitat um, quality. So um, they really are great indicators of the health of a stream. And as you can imagine, in our drought situation that we're in, um, that's even more of a stressor on top of the entire systems. Uh, basically, the conditions vary by watershed, as you might imagine. Um, in some cases, trends are stable, um, such as in the Alameda Creek. 
In other cases, um, trends are um, declining, such as up in Panola, up in the Panola Creek watershed. So that kind of tells us where we could focus more, more management effort. Um, conditions overall, though, are basically improving to the extent practical, again, during our drought and little stream flow years, um, with restoration efforts such as at the McCosker site, where we're restoring over um, a mile, I believe, of, of stream um, in the East Bay Hills region. Um, and then there's a lot of effort in the Alameda Creek region to um, remove uh, barriers to fish passage. So, so that's the good news. We, we can target in going into the future, you know, potentially improve stream conditions for fish. Um, the next group that we looked at are amphibians. And thanks to uh, Becky's early introduction about how the presence of California leg frog, California related frogs measured into um, our metrics and, and what the condition of that was. We uh, applied similar analyses to the California tiger salamander. Both the red-legged frog and tiger salamander, as you're probably aware, are listed species, federal and state listed species. So we're under obligations to protect them on so many levels. Um, and then another indicator for amphibians and reptiles is written small here because we, we um, did not emphasize any single reptile species like we did for red-legged frog or salamander, but we are including them in overall diversity. In other words, looking at the range of species of, amph of amphibians and reptiles uh, um, that can be detected um, during surveys. Um, this is a very complex slide, but it gets at a really interesting um, a phenomenon known as uh, metapopulations. This is um, basically uh, groups of, uh, this, is, uh, for, this map is for the California red-legged frog. Um, and what it shows indicates are all the dots that you see are ponds spread throughout our networks um, through the agency lands and space stewardship network lands. And each individual pond can be identified as either a core site, it's got a little black circle around it, um, or a non-core site where it's maybe outside of the range of um, what might be known as a group of uh, metapopulations. So basically, um, metapopulations compose of a lot of subpopulations that are connected through migration, and in other words, through gene flow. And in this case, um, our amphibian group decided that all ponds within three kilometers of one another would be essentially belonging to that metapopulation. Uh, in other words, there's a significant proximity for the amphibians to move from one pond to the other and thus keep gene flow going, which of course is very important for the long-term sustainability of any population. Um, so those metapopulations were then grouped into habitat units. And that's what you see here outlined in green for Pleasant and Garen or down here at Del Val. Um, so we can really look at how are the habitat units doing and how are their metapopulations doing. Um, and some of the summary results from that is that uh, basically, you know, we do maintain a good network of ponds. Um, the stewardship network alone has on the order of 1,126 ponds. Um, and the East Bay Regional Park District itself, we have about 556 ponds. Um, many of these ponds, not all, but many of these ponds actually, you know, stem from the original um, grazing and cattle uh, ra raising um, ranch lands, stock ponds are basically created to provide water for, um, for cattle. And, you know, as time went on, as the decades went on, um, amphibians such as red frogs and tiger salamanders, they become extremely important habitats to maintain these species um, in the East Bay network. Um, so by looking at these arrays of metapopulations um, and habitat units, we can get a better idea of how can we interconnect habitat units and metapopulations with one another. Um, and moving forward then, this will help us to um, identify particular important areas where we can do pond restoration that will help provide stepping stones to maintain connectivity um, between all of these groups of populations. Um, so that's, that's been a real key thing, this metapopulation concept. Moving on to bird guilds, a uh, subject next to my heart. Um, for this analysis, uh, we actually looked at um, we incorporated the use of eBird data. That is a citizen science approach um, where the public can go out and record on their cell phones where they see birds um, and load them up to eBird data. So it really makes use of, um, of you know, boots on the ground in terms of the public getting out there and identifying species and uh, creating these data sets where, which are every day, they're just growing and growing and growing. It's an incredible resource, whether it's eBird or the other um, major interconnected system is INAT. 
Um, we decided, of course, to look at birds. Birds are a great indicator of ecosystem health, um, even on a species basis. Just think of the peregrine falcon and DDT from the 1960s and 1970s that basically screamed, I'm going rare, I'm going extinct because of DDT. We were able to focus on that and get that out of the, um, out of the environment and save that individual species. Um, but then looking at the larger group of birds, they, the otherwise known as a guild or a group of birds associated with a particular habitat can give you a better picture of how that habitat is doing and what tweaks we can possibly do to that habitat to improve it um, should there be signs of trouble. Um, so we did select 28 species divided up into four bird guilds and that would be riparian habitat, oak woodland, shrubland and grassland. Um, and then to actually get at the bird guilds, we had to go through individual species to build the guild and look at how the individual species are doing relative to the guild itself. So this map here on the right um, shows a, a snapshot of eBird data for the song sparrow, pictured down here in the lower right. It's a riparian species, it belongs to the riparian guild. Um, and each of the dots indicate, like black indicates it was not present in 2020. Um, green indicates it was repeatedly uh, um, uh, identified through eBird at a particular location over multiple years, and white means it was not present in a given year. So this gives us a yearly snapshot from 2010 to 2020 of the presence of this bird um, in the given in the given matrix. And from that, then one can uh, look at the trend as you know is it going up or down, um, and then row up all of these individual species, like for the riparian birds, we then include like spotted towhee, um, uh, Wilson's warbler, uh, warbling vireo, um, and come up with an overall sort of sense of the health of the individual bird guild. Um, and basically summarizing those data for these various guilds, um, for the riparian guild, which consists of nine species, the oak woodland guild of nine species, shrubland, habitats of only three species, um, the trend has been unchanging. That is relatively stable for these, for these last, uh, for this last decade or 11 years. Um, one thing that is very concerning is the grassland. Uh, we looked at seven species and that trend is declining. And this actually mirrors what's going on nationwide as far as grassland birds. Um, Audubon has declared uh, uh, grassland birds one of the most, uh, you know, most threatened group of birds in North America. Um, it also kind of highlights the fact that a recent study by Rosenberg in 2019 looked at uh, the full suite of species found in North America and determined that there was a 57% decline um, across, uh, well, yeah, 57%, let me rephrase that, 57% of the species of North American birds have declined from 1970 up to the current time period. So our time period is a little bit later, it's just the last 11 years. Um, so whether or not our riparian is unchanging for those 11 years for oak or shrubland, that's great. Um, but relative to say the 1970s, um, we, we, uh, we may have a, moving forward, we may have to um, reassess that. Moving on to the next species, golden eagle. Um, that is of course an iconic species. It's an apex, apex, apex predator. It's long lived, it's widely distributed um, and it's, you know, it's, as I said, it's iconic. Um, human societies have uh, revered this bird throughout, um, throughout history. Uh, so it's very important um, for both, uh, for both uh, the human environment and the natural environment. It turns out uh, that the Northern Diablo Range, uh, of which we are, which we are part of, um, has one of the densest nesting populations of golden eagles um, in the world. And it happens to be a tree nesting population, which is um, rather unusual relative to most of the other Western states like Colorado or Oregon, where it's a cliff nesting species. Um, we were able to analyze um, site occupancy, reproductive rate, and the presence of territorial subadults within the population. Um, by collaborating with the US Geological Survey, um, the district has a history, a long standing history of, of monitoring raptors uh, going back to the 1980s. So we have great historical data sets on the Golden Eagle. Um, and we've been able to collaborate and partner with US Geological Study Service on their study, which began in 2014 on the golden eagles of the Northern Diablo Range. So up here in this map, in the far upper right-hand corner is the entire Northern Diablo Range um, illustrated. And we're just a portion of that. And this sort of honeycomb network that you see 
our grid cells that, um, for the USGS occupancy study overlaid over the entire study area. Um, a grid cell corresponds to about 1,300 hectares, which is the um, equivalent of a, like the core territory size of a golden eagle. Um, and then out of these grid cells, they selected randomly uh, subsets of cells to then survey for the occupancy study. Um, and then they used occupancy modeling and analysis and their survey data combined actually with um, our volunteer Golden Eagle monitoring team. That's another major asset of this, of this effort in that we have a, a number of volunteers um, that are participating in the study and contributing data to it. Um, so that being said, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, concerns that we have, and I'm certainly here in East Bay Hills, I, I should correct myself in the, um, in the um, Diablo Altamont Hills in between the Livermore area and Tracy is the Altamont Wind Pass resource area. And it has long been identified as a source of great mortality through wind turbine strikes for the Golden Eagle. Um, and so that's part of the reason why the USGS has come um, and embarked upon this study is to determine um, how sustainable is our local population facing um, these threats, uh, the threat of um, you know, increased uh, or in ongoing mortality um, in the Altamont, in addition to development, in addition to other factors such as um, you know, roadkill and you name it, um, electrocutions on power lines and that sort of thing. So there are definitely stressors out there. Um, some of the interesting aspects of this is site occupancy. I mentioned it was a long-lived species. Um, they can live 20, 27 years, we had one banded bird that was, that was found a couple of years ago that was at least 27 years old, it was found dead. Um, site occupancy, occupancy for 2014 to the present has been unchanging, meaning pairs are still on their territories. So that's the good news, that's really good news. Um, however, one of the other aspects is, um, uh, the, this reproductive rate in territorial subadults. So the reproductive rate um, is really getting hammered, so to speak, by the droughts. We had a five-year drought um, earlier and now we're into our third year of drought. So that's really affecting um, whether or not we, can, we will have a self-sustaining population in the face of these stressors. And then finally, the incidence of territorial subadults. Those are um, ju teenagers basically moving in and taking over a breeding territory that incidence is increasing in some areas, especially like in the Mount Diablo and um, Northern Mount Hamilton area. So this increase of teenagers becoming breeders is a sign that there might be some instability to the population because there aren't enough adults to um, take over uh, a new breeding area. So it's a concern, but it's important to keep, uh, um, keep tabs on species like this. The next species, ground squirrel, um, it, uh, it's, it's a, it's, as, as Becky alluded to, it's often considered a pest. Um, it's gone through a lot of stressors in historical times and that it was poisoned extensively throughout, uh, throughout a lot of the open public lands and agricultural lands. Um, and surprisingly, we have limited data on the ground squirrel. Um, it's not been a, you know, a species of focus for a lot of folks, but um, for us, we consider it was important because it really is a keystone species, as Becky mentioned. Um, it's also an ecosystem engineer. So it's keystone in terms of feeding everything out there from rattlesnakes to golden eagles and in terms of being an ecosystem engineer um, through its burrow systems, it creates habitat for everything from insects to threatened and endangered enlisted um, um, amphibians and reptiles and on up to burrowing owls and other, other species. So it really is a, uh, an important ecosystem indicator. Um, there are indications of declines of the um, ground squirrel uh, uh, colonies in the in the hills of the Altamont, uh, but other areas appear to be relatively relatively healthy. Uh, one good aspect of this too is that we're using community science to improve our data resolution. So Tammy Lim, one of our wildlife biologists, has created a, a project for ground squirrel um, capture, uh, you know, observations in INAT. So moving forward, we'll be able to obtain a um, lot more in interesting information on that. Dropping into the meso carnivores. Um, we chose a suite of seven species, um, three of which are common and the rest of which are rare. Of uh, the common species, bobcat, coyote, gray fox, um, rare species, badger, long-tailed weasel, spotted skunk, and ringtail. These pictures show four of them. Here's a badger. These are taken by camera traps. That's one of the major tools of this effort is having camera trap arrays out into the landscape to um, take pictures of whoever wanders into the field of view. Here's a bobcat. 
There's a gray fox and here's a coyote. Um, overall, the common species, their condition is good. Bobcat, coyote, and gray fox, as you can imagine. Rare species, they range from good to um, caution to a significant concern. So for instance, the badger um, has, is uh, rated as a good condition in terms of presence in the sub-regions. Um, and long-tailed weasel, spotted skunk, or caution, and ring tail is of significant concern. So again, these metrics help us try to tease apart which species may require more effort moving forward. Um, another iconic species that was chosen for this analysis is the, is the puma or mountain lion. Um, its metrics involve looking at annual presence in each subregion and whether it's breeding or not, again, mostly through camera trap photographs. Um, and one of the metrics um, in terms of presence was um, determining whether how often uh, the animals would be detected in cameras on an annual basis. And if in any one region for two consecutive years, there were no detections, then it would be a reason for um, significant concern. And looking at the two, three subregions, uh, East Bay Hills and Mount Hamilton region are good, um, but uh, the Mount Diablo region has this um, non-detect for two years in a row. An important aspect of all of this too with the puma is it also highlights the connectivity of habitat. So if we want to, um, and hopefully moving forward, get a better sense and better population or um, get a sense more cats into the Mount Diablo region, they're gonna have to be connected to the Mount Hamilton region. And of course, you may realize we have Highway 5 and a number of other highways that crisscross the Altamont that may be barriers to that movement. So this helps us to at least identify pinch points um, also like the Dublin intergrade that might, um, that might uh, be a pinch point between uh, the Hamilton and the East Bay Hills range. So that, that can help us identify um, and participate in the, in the grand scheme of developing corridors and wildlife movements um, that is actually a statewide effort. The last species I think to cover is um, our bats. Um, we have again, limited data speaking, speaking to data gaps. Um, but uh, that that's in and of itself tells us what we need to do. Um, but of the metrics that we've been looking at, species richness and activity, um, with the anticipation that we'll that in any of our three subregions we could have anywhere from fourteen to sixteen species. Ideally, that would be the great condition, um, the, the good condition. Um, so, species richness is an important uh, uh, measurement that we're taking as well as activity, that is bat call rate, that gives us a sense of the abundance of bats. And then also focusing on sentinel roosting sites. Um, bats are great indicators of, again, the ecosystem health in terms of insect health, but also very specific habitat types like roosting sites that bats depend on, such as cliffs with crevices um, or sycamore trees in the instance of the Thompson's bigger bat that needs um, um, specific chambers, as it were, for roosting and over, overwintering. Um, so again, they're great indicators of the larger picture of some of the very particular habitat um, elements that are important to bats. So summaries, summarizing those, um, we did document a relatively full suite of bats throughout the region. Um, in terms of species richness though, um, we have caution um, overall and a trend declining in the Mount Hamilton region, but yet increasing in East Bay Hills. Um, so, uh, hopefully with data gaps, we'll, um, filling some of the data gaps, we'll get a better sense of how, how these trends are panning out and um, whether or not we can uh, embark on further management actions. So with that, um, I've run through this really quickly. Uh, if, if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. And again, um, feel free to check out our Nature Check, the document, which provides a lot more specific information. So I thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to turn this back over to Becky Tudin now. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, you know, adaptive management, we're going to continue the data collection and compare it to the baseline every five years. Uh, we're going to complete the vegetation mapping and a nature check report on vegetation and then cross that, uh, crosswalk that with our wildlife data and get a much richer view of the overall ecosystem. And we're also um, embarking on an effort with Cal Academy and um, the interpretation and rec group within the park district to look at invertebrates. And that would involve using community science, both um, the existing studies where we have for INAT or eBird, um, but also perhaps Sonobat and invertebrates. 
Um, but the biggest opportunity and that what I really want to draw um, this committee's attention to is to capitalize on the East Bay Stewardship Network and the benefits of collaborating across jurisdictional lines. Um, what we have, the information we have will allow us to um, jointly see what's working and not working and help us um, pick shared priorities. Uh, and we've been doing that on the staff level, but it's been extracurricular to date. And uh, what we're hoping is that we can knit together more formalized agency partnerships and priority setting. So we don't have just scientists sitting around the table, but land managers, funders, and board members like yourselves at committee meetings or liaison, liaison meetings um, where we can scaffold the existing nature check assessments and direct our efforts um, to improve those habitats that we, we have assessment information telling us are most important and also um, improve our competitiveness for grant funding. So look for those topics in the future, uh, meeting agendas and conversations. Uh, and uh, with that, we had a ton of people working on this, fabulous people and innovative approach. Um, Tammy Lim uh, isn't here today, but she really was instrumental. And you heard all of the uh, research that Doug mentioned. There were hordes of people behind that. Thank you. Uh, let me know if you have any questions for Doug or me. Well, you know, I do have an initial question and that is um, who is actually gathering um, all of this information. Is it um, staff for the agencies that are collaborating? Is it um, uh, citizen scientists, for instance, in the in um, bird surveys? Um, how do you get this information? So that's an excellent question. Oh, uh, oh. Uh, I'm gonna let um, Doug speak to some of the specifics, but more broadly, we just, we were capitalizing on information that we were already gathering. So staff does pond surveys. We also do pond surveys as part of land use documents or EIR. So that's where we got a lot of that information. For the um, bird guilds, that was community scientists over the last 50 years who've been putting data in to that and that we were able then to extract it and analyze it. And, um, and fish surveys, we've been doing that, and that's staff who are doing that. So it really varies by species. The Golden Eagle was the USGS who's been doing studies on that. So it, it depended on what the species was, what the existing data is, because we didn't really want to add new tasks to what data we were already gathering. We wanted to capitalize on what data we are currently gathering. The exception, I think, being the ground squirrels, whereas Doug mentioned we haven't done a lot of data gathering on that. Doug, you want to step up and say anything? Sure. Yeah, I would just add, too, um, in terms of where the data are, where they sit, is um, we do gather the data, and that's one of the things that uh, stewardship is working on to improve is our, our management of databases. So that's very important. So all of these data do eventually come to a central storehouse right now. Um, it's 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 basically in in our in our bailiwick um, to store that data and manage it. Um, so uh, but so for instance, the data that are taken from from eBird, you know, they're extracted from the eBird network from you know their data systems. They're brought into our system, and then we had consultants do the analysis on the data, the actual technical analysis. Um, but then we we still have that core data. So then moving forward. In five years or so, if we repeat the, um, the, the eBird thing, we'll pull out the next five years of data and then analyze that and move it forward. Um, and then, you know, ideally then these data are also available to um, uh, other researchers and other agencies as needed. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, you know, that, that's, um, that is helpful. Um, I'll have another question too, but let me ask um, the committee members if they have questions or comments. Yes, Ellen. Well, um, I have a thousand questions <laughs> and I'm sure we can have conversations at another time, but I'm, I'm just um, in, in some of the maps that you've shown, uh, for example, where the, um, the um, 
I don't even know where to start to question. But, yet, but we have cattle uh, areas where ca cattles, you know, uh, that. Uh, end up um, using those areas uh, to live and eat the, eat the uh, ground. <laughs> we also have areas there where we have, um, according to the map and according to my own eye view, we have places where we find the, um, I'm sorry, the wild cats are. So what do, how do we, what do we do about that? Do we, are we, do we look at that? Do we have a concern what, what sort of impacts there could have um, in those areas? Uh, so I'm just gonna share the amphibian screen. Um, and, and just to clarify your question, you're wondering whether the cattle grazing is impacting some of these habitat types? Is that, is that your question? Well, no, I'm, I'm talking about the, uh, I'm sorry, I, the word, the name is not coming to my mind, but it's the large... Um, Puma? You're talking yes. about the Puma? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Can we look at that map? Yes. Does that help? Yeah. I can tell you from my own view, there are areas, especially over near Lake Chabot, where the map does not show where you have seen them, the puma. However, um, you know, they're, they're in those areas. They're also in areas that are used for, for cattle. So do we, do we worry about those things? Um, um, there is Puma all around Lake Chabot, both sides of the highway, et cetera. Right. Well, we, these data were collected through camera traps. So um, ah. they're specific to where the cameras were set up. So in, in that sense, that would explain, I mean, Pumas have been seen in downtown Berkeley. They've been seen in Wildcat Creek. Um, they are seen regularly, well, serendipitously throughout, throughout the East Bay Hills. Um, so, so again, it's the camera traps identified. And if you look down below towards um, uh, um, San Francisco water, that's a great area. It says there's no data available for, the, for that agency because they, they don't, did not have any camera trap arrays set up um, over the period of this particular study. Um, so hopefully, you know, as time moves forward, they'll get camera arrays set up in that region as well so we can collect better data, likewise up around Contra Costa Reservoir. Um, Los Vaqueros Reservoir, um, that could potentially be another area where we could fill in a data gap. So, so, I mean, we do know that pumas are found in a lot of different areas, but for the camera arrays, they then help us develop population metrics such as breeding state and that sort of thing. So um, it can give us a snapshot of how these animals are doing in these particular regions. As far as worries about cattle grazing, we've not, um, you know, a range person isn't right here to, to tell you, but we've had no reports of any, in the last several years, of any sort of um, puma cattle depredation event or suspected event. Um, so, of course, one worries about everything. You know, coyotes are, are quite active in the landscape, and we do get reports of coyote depredation on cattle every now and then. Um, so, it's part of the concern, but um, it's, it's not really elevated to the point of we would need to take a management action. And we do have grazing leases on, what, about 85, 86,000 acres of our properties. And the ranchers are performing you know, really great ecosystem service in terms of reducing fuel load um, and, and uh, maintaining, helping to maintain biodiversity in terms of the grassland landscapes, um, such as keeping ground squirrels happy and healthy. I have so many questions I can ask. And I, I would want to ask a little bit about some of the other animals that are that are wild in certain areas. But, but you know, I think maybe I'll have figured a time we can have a conversation with you at another time. Because uh, there's just, um, well, first of all, I appreciate the fact that you've shared this information with us. Um, and we want to, of course, make sure we do what we can to uh, protect and prepare uh, a, a great place for the, the wild animals that are in our open space. Um, so uh, I think I'll 
figure out a time I can meet with you. I'm going to have a, a, I seriously have a thousand questions I can ask you. I'd cut it down to 10. <laughs> it's wonderful. We welcome your questions and um, we're very excited to have this um, research. You can see a lot of effort went into it and we have kind of fine results that we can um, look at are also big results that we can um, discuss. And then I, I know Matt Yeah, I appreciate it. It's, it's an amazing thing that in the parts of the district I happen to represent, um, we see these, uh, these wild animals uh, in people's neighborhoods, backyards, they hear them. People aren't complaining about them. They think it's amazing, you know, that that's all, all there in that area. And um, so it, it is working. Like, for example, how you said that, uh, that there weren't problems with uh, cattle and the, and the puma. Um, and, and that's true. They, they live in that area. You see it at, at night. They're walking through certain people's neighborhoods. It's just amazing that we live in an area where we have these wild animals. So, so I guess the question will be, what do we do to continue to protect them and, um, you know, keep a people safe in their neighborhoods as well um, and uh, keep our open space as a place where people can spend some time and so can the puma <laughs> because they obviously love some large parts of the land that the East Bay Region Park District is responsible for. I mean, it, it's amazing what we do that protects them. So anyway, I could talk about many of the other animals too, but I'll, I'll be quiet and let the rest of people say something. But I do, I would love to have a conversation and, and, and get some of my questions answered. Thank you. Yeah, and well, thanks Director Corbett and Matt Grawl, Chief of Stewardship for the people listening that don't know me. But um, Director Corbett, thanks for your interest, really appreciate it. I'll follow up with you after the meeting at some point, just to talk a little more about it, to determine like your questions and we can put together a quick meeting with other staff. I know our staff that have worked on this are very passionate about it. So they'd be happy to meet and talk more about it. I mean, Doug and Becky can certainly uh, carry a lot of it, but I know the staff that worked on it are also very interested too. So we could put together a little meeting and um, just get, get into a lot of the details because I know we're all really excited about the information and data. So thank you. And I agree, Doug and Becky have been very involved in these types of uh, putting this information together for, for a long time and it wouldn't be happening without them. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs> um, Colin, do you have any comments or questions? Sure, sure thank you. Are we using uh, Puma as synonymous with mountain lion? Yes. Okay. I been thinking that a puma was a version of mountain lion as opposed to just what we commonly refer to as mountain lions. You know, there was a mountain lion sighted in my hometown in Hercules, I think last week on the western side of Highway 80, and that's unheard of. Um, we, we hear about them up in the hills on the eastern edge where we're closer to Grionis, but that was amazing. Um, where can I find uh, Nature Check? Is it on the evparks.org website? Yes, it is. And you know what? I will email you the direct link to each of the um, yeah. board it's members. Not, I definitely, I mean, that's something like Ellen says, we're, we all have our animals that we're interested in. So I, I'd like to download it or, or read it online uh, one way or the other and look uh, up some of these critters. Um, it's pretty dense reading, I warn you. Don't be sleepy. <laughs> Every report you people do is, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> oh, all right, I'll send you the, well, just so you know, um, Bay Nature, the um, magazine is uh -huh. putting together a supplement on um, our Nature Check report. And so that's probably gonna be a nice, you know, 30,000 foot overview of the results. Okay, I'll keep an eye open for that. And that was one of my questions is how do you get the, you know, you publish it on our website, but, um, and, and no doubt to this network, everybody get, gets copies. Um, is there a broader audience that we can get this out to? A absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we um, are going to be working with our interpretive staff, especially where we have community science opportunities where they can gather, um, where the public can be used to gather more data. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, we put something in our Compass magazine about it and we have put out a press release, but um, we, we do need to do more to get this out there. Yeah, it just makes me proud that we're able to do this sort of work um, and, and have the resources to do it and can uh, serve the greater good through it. Um, it, it, it I, I enjoy that. Uh, I have a, a, a philosophical question, I guess, for Doug. 
what is the proper approach to the impact of drought on on some of these critters you know uh, i feel really bad when i go by a dried up pond and see dead turtles for instance and i'm wondering you know could we have done something to help these uh, turtles out in in light of the drought or is the philosophical approach or professional approach I, I might use in reference to you, Doug, and is, you know, do you let drought just go on and, and, and harm the critters or, and, and I'll just use a close to home um, uh, illustration. There are several of us in my neighborhood who put out water for deer because for the first time in my memory, the creek that runs down the canyon we live in um, is totally dry. It, you, there used to be enough groundwater during the summer to keep little puddles throughout the creek. And you know, my, my house is right next to it and it was Grand Central Station here because there were little puddles of water all year round um, and, and critters coming around. It, it isn't there anymore. And the, the fear several of us have had is that these, you know, you see baby deer born and we, we put out buckets of water where they hang out. Is that a bad thing? Um, well, the answer to your question is no. Um, we, 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 I don't think any of us are just, in a sense, sitting by and letting nature take its course in terms of the drought. We're looking at what's, what its effect is across the spectrum of animals that we're looking at. And we're also looking at potential you know, management options. And, and one key management option has to do with pond restoration and um, springs and that sort of thing. So um, we are trying to prioritize areas where ponds can be restored um, that may be able to maintain water and improve, actually improve the, you know, improve the hydrology of the pond itself. We've had a consultant looking at hydrology of a number of our ponds um, and that's helping us to inform us as to how, what options we have for a given pond to be able to have it retain water longer. And I mean, it's, it's yeah, it is stunning out there, um, Director Coffey, in terms of, we've seen perennial ponds um, talk to ranchers, you know, that they've seen, a, they've had a perennial pond in their family for 80, 85 years and they're dry. They've never gone dry up until this point. So it's region wide, definitely, it's almost catastrophic, but, um, if there's things we can do to um, maintain a few ponds moving forward and, you know, and or the hydrology of a stream network or a stream reach uh, to improve perhaps a riparian habitat, you know, restoration that helps retain water rather than having it just run off. So there's a lot of little tiny management tweaks that we can potentially do to try to combat that situation. But I think all of us are scratching our heads, you know, looking to the future as to what can we do um, in addition you know, looking at how habitats can, can change and how species can move as, this, as the drought increases or as climate gets warmer. Um, that's also important to keep in mind for corridors to allow animals and, and plants as well to respond to the landscape, like maybe departing the hotter lower lands for slightly higher elevations. So there's really, it's, it's really an active field of research and um, none of us are sitting by and just letting nature take its course. Yeah, I just want to um, add to that is that uh, the studies, the nature check did show that our native amphibians are doing well, um, especially compared to the invasive species that need perennial water like um, the bullfrog. The only um, caveat to that is that, um, we stopped at 2020, so the last two years of drought are not included in these numbers. But the, the core populations and the meta populations that Doug talked about, if, uh, we can make sure that if those ponds, at least a few ponds within a meta population are perennial or, or needed throughout the breeding season for those amphibians, then they can repopulate those satellite ponds. So that's an example of how this report can help direct our restoration efforts to be more effective in climate change. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the report. It's uh, great work, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Ellen. I'm sorry, Dr. Lane. Um, I just want to say, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to leave for another meeting. Uh, so let me know that. But thank you again also for these, this presentation and all, the, all that you shared with us. I 
my brain was just going like this, thanks to all that you shared with us. Didn't ask my questions quite the right way, but I'm looking forward to that opportunity to have that conversation with you. So thank you for the great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Hey, um, I'm sorry you have to go, but we appreciate your questions. So, uh, And I do have a couple of questions. Um, one has to do with uh, data that is um, desirable being generated uh, from our partners. So is, is part of the collaboration, um, each representative of the different agencies um, lobbying one another on how they're going to collect data because you, um, uh, one of the things you said was San Francisco PUC doesn't uh, keep track of um, uh, Pumas in a way for us to say what is there on some of their property. So how, do, how does that go? Are you working to influence one another? So that's a very good question. Um, you know, for the fish and amphibians, because they're listed species or because they just have a history of um, wanting to monitor those species, it was very mutual, the amount of data that came in. Um, for some of these other species uh, where we invested in the camera traps, um, they did not, although there is interest in doing so. And now we have a framework where if they wanted to set them up, you know, it would be a common streamlined and consistent um, data collection, but that's really why we want to take this East Bay stewardship network concept and take it just out of the staff and bring it up to the managers and to maybe even the um, people such as yourselves, the board members to say, hey, it's no longer extracurricular. We really wanna to work to see what data is still needed and how we can collaborate on that. Uh, okay, because, um, and that is a, a another step, we do have regular meetings with East Bay Mud. Mm -hmm. And um, we put things on the agenda <laughs> to, to be discussed. And if there are um, uh, items that you might be interested in uh, influencing East Bay Mud to do that they don't do now, um, you might give one of us a call. Uh, uh, we don't need to do that, that now, you. but uh, <laughs> and, and we, uh, we don't meet that regularly with with the other agencies, you know, as, as uh, board members. But we do meet with East Bay Mud, and um, and likewise, you know, if there were something from some of the other agencies, you need to take advantage of the fact that you have Nature Check going now, and um, ask that that be on the agenda when we do have those meetings and then talk about um, how we could have some of these conversations which would make the whole um, production more robust. So uh, if you could keep that in mind and uh, you might give me a call if there's something with East Bay Mud because we have a meeting coming up. Oh, okay. We will, yes, yes, we will definitely follow up. Thank you. That's exactly what we hope to do is, is bring it to their attention. And, and then if need, we need extra funds, we're perfectly poised for grant applications because we are so, you know, landscape wide with um, climate resiliency data we're gathering. So, yeah. Okay. So I don't know who's putting together the East Bay Mud uh, Park District meeting, but that is coming up and you might contact whoever, you know, things are kind of disrupted as to who, I think public affairs used to do that. But anyway, um, you might make the suggestion that we spend a little time on nature check. Okay. And we could get some feedback. Uh, and if there's something you're particularly, you'd particularly like to see them pursue, you know, ask us to ask them, you know. Absolutely, um, thank you. Okay, and then my final one has to do with um, uh, the map that you put up, Doug, that had to do with the fish. 
and you were looking at the watersheds because I do have a, a watershed question. Um, so you talked about four watersheds and the reason you selected those was that you had uh, information, um, cur current information on those, on those watersheds. And I um, noticed that the, um, um, a Walnut Creek watershed was not included. And I think in the middle of the map, I think that's the Alameda Creek watershed that is in Contra Costa County. Or am I looking at that incorrectly? This one here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, you know, the gray one, is that Alameda in Contra Costa County? It's on the border. Well, because Tassahara, you know, Alamo Creek and Tassahara Creek flow into Alameda Creek. Correct. That is correct. That would be the, these two, that's Tassahara okay. and Alamo Creek. Yeah. Um, because I, I remember reading, first Alameda, I remember reading um, some findings that were very interesting to me, you know, the historical examination of of um, watersheds that um, Grossinger and some others I think have done. And when it came to the county line, they didn't go north. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so <laughs> that's part of the watershed and why is that? And then the Walnut Creek watershed is one that I know that I'm most familiar with and um, there have been issues where public work says, well, there's never any fish in there, <laughs> and, which is not true. So are you saying in neither of those gray areas that I'm talking about, is anybody doing any research that would allow these to be folded into Nature Creek or would you say a little more about those areas? Yeah, well, I think the answer is um, there's potential for them to be folded into this. That's one of the beauties of this whole project is we hope to bring in partner agencies and partner um, jurisdictions to contribute to the, you know, the overall data collection and look at the health of the region. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of friends of creeks, um, friends of Marsh Creek, um, you know, friends of... Uh, Walnut Creek organizations that are doing the, the rapid surveys. So there is a lot of information and effort going into a lot of these other creeks, even lower Walnut Creek is undergoing a, a very large restoration effort right now, um, funded by, funded by um, you know, one, of the, one of the water uh, agencies up there or water treatment agencies up there. So there, is, there really is a mosaic of effort um, looking at all of the creeks of the region. And that would be a great goal for us to start to fold in those regions. Um, as, as far as, um, again, the, the Mount Diablo subregion, they're, they're just having, the historical data are just not particularly available to us that, um, that we have comparable for the four creek stream reaches that we, that we chose. Um, but it doesn't mean we cannot start adding data to the system as we move forward. So, I mean, yeah, the creeks are of extreme interest, like Marsh Creek itself, um, they, you know, they created a fish, fish passage, such that fish now I think we get up to, to the John Marsh Park and Dam at that point. So maybe in the future, you know, so there's a lot of information based on the lower reaches of Marsh Creek. Um, so yeah, hopefully we can fold them in and bring, bring them into, um, Bring them into the larger data set. Okay, so essentially you're saying there's scattered information mm -hmm. in these other areas that doesn't readily fold into Nature Check. Well, it could be it could fold into it in terms of the metrics and or the metrics could be improved moving forward. So it kind of depends on the nature of the data. Sometimes data can be analyzed in terms of the metric. Um, even though the data weren't specifically taken for that particular purpose. Um, so it, it just depends on what's what's out there and what's available. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's important to note that we started small uh, with just four agencies. And as Doug mentioned, we're at the stage now where we have a pretty good platform of what our metrics are and what we're collecting data on. And we're about to expand that. We can bring in other organizations. We didn't have anyone in the four other agencies that we were working with that was doing 
fish surveys on those portions of the, the streams you mentioned. Um, and I think also not all of them do have um, the rainbow trout that we, we picked that as a particular species. Moving forward, we can look, we can work with those partners, see what um, data they have, see what other species they have that we might want to include. Okay, well, I'm, I, was, I was just interested in the, in the gaps there. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anything else, Colin? No, thank you. I, I appreciate your doing this work and uh, having it available on the internet. And I'm looking forward to seeing the, uh, it's gonna be a special supplement for Bay Nature. Yes, it should be coming out this fall, so pretty soon. Okay, well, very cool. All right, well, thank you very much, Becky, and thank you, Doug. I, I appreciate it today. Thank you. Thank you very and, much. And then I would like to see if there's any public comment on this item on the agenda. Sabrina, did you get anybody wanting to comment? No, oh, Director Lane, we do not have any public comment, and there are no uh, people, um, additional public members in the Zoom call at this time. All right, thank you very much. So let's move on to our next item, which is East Bay Park Archives virtual tour and needs with an assessment report update. Um, Brenda Montana. Hi, Brenda. Hello, hello, Director Lane, and hello, Director Coffey. Um, that, that presentation that we just saw was amazing, and um, I'm still so honored um, and uh, that I work here at the park district alongside these folks. So, yeah. um, and I do love them. I love running into them and talking with them. So um, I'm going to be sharing a virtual tour, which is a video. Um, it is a little over 15 minutes. That's to make it kind. Um, and then I'll be following up with a few uh, PowerPoint slides to talk about the needs assessment. But um, I know we had talked about uh, doing a tour of the archives. Um, and when I first started working on the project, I realized that um, I couldn't leave out the other places that are in, um, are in my uh, uh, plan of stewardship of the uh, cultural resources. So I wanted to kind of include some of those as well. So um, I'm going to share my screen and start the video. Welcome everyone. We are here at the Trudeau Training Center at the start of the virtual tour that I wanted to share with all of you about the archives and where we're at. Let's go on inside. As we enter the archives, we come right into the working room. Before COVID, there used to be 12 to 15 volunteers every Wednesday gathered around this table, going through these boxes. One of the current working projects that we're doing, these beautiful acid-free brand new sleeves will be the new homes for historic negatives, mostly taken by one man, Martin J. Cooney. These are actually his handwritten notes documenting land acquisition photos before the parks became parks, photographs of staff, special events, you name it. We are going to be working on selecting some of the best of his that we can actually put on our website for people to peruse and take a look at. We're very excited about that project. Let's go on into the library and scanning table room. In here is a very special table that was built by one of our volunteers, Bill Vidor, inventing specifically for the archives. We needed something that would flatten the maps delicately enough that it wouldn't harm the map itself, but then we can also get a high-res image of the actual map. Now this map is from the 1930s when the Park District was first being built by the CCC. Back then, San Pablo was the African-American camp and this map shows some of the trails and the roadways that they worked on. The next map, probably the 1960s of Contra Loma Regional Park, we have this unique overlay of showing what they thought that they would have at this park. Train depot, equestrian center, all the hand-drawn concepts. These are just a treasure to show the creativity and the vision of our wonderful staff here. 
And uh, around the room, we have Park District publications. We have very unique books. Most of them are out of print. We're now in the main archives room, which I affectionately call the Manhattan Room because of the number of file cabinets that are in here. These are all fireproof. Here we put all of our founding and legacy documents. Just this last year, creating the Online Archives of California finding aid and catalog system so people can actually know that we have these. One of the ones that's our treasure is the 1940 master plan. A lot of it is hand-colored and hand-drawn by Elbert Vale, who was our first general manager here at the Park District. We also have information about bond measures, and how we develop them, and mainly Rosemary Cameron, former AGM of Public Affairs. She did come here and donate a lot of her files. And then these are the 35 millimeter slides. Again, I would love to mention Bill Vidor. He invented a way to scan slides that is ingenious. Over these 15 years, he's gone up to almost 30,000 slides. And then here we have our oral histories, but I also add biographies, photographs, uh, press releases. There's resumes when board directors uh, first started. We also have the most extensive collection of fire history material in here, and we have Jerry Kent, one of our volunteers at the archives, to thank for that. The majority of the history that's in here is post-park history, so when the park was dedicated and signature events and things like that. But there is some cultural history here, and we try to collect that as we go. And this is what I like to call our media room. This side of the wall is a very special collection from a filmmaker. Her name is Judy Irving. She filmed alongside Bob Walker and many of our East Bay Regional Parks. We've received a grant through California Revealed to digitize her final movies online. Over here on this side of the wall are uh, DVDs, VHS. We've got hard drives there of all kinds of press release videos, PSAs, Doug McConnell shows. On this side, we have patches. From the early patches to the 1980s, we have patches that are our district uniforms. Here, this is Randy Parent, who was a helicopter pilot with us for many years. Finally, the carousel rolls for the organ. That's at the Tilden Merry-Go-Round. Just recently, I've been talking with the concessionaire about trying to use some of these rolls again at their organ this building it used to be the park district headquarters and this was their vault it always had a set of maps along the wall all of these maps are in the proficio database and then there is the garage a lot of the field finds items from the burrell property the murphy proviance which is the round valley property and a menagerie of other places do we keep them? Do they have exhibit value? When we have a future museum or a facility, we need to discuss and curate what we have. And last and certainly not least, there's the computer lab. And during the pandemic, it became a workspace for the volunteers. It's a perfect location for processing. It's central. We can bring items from other parts of the district here and decide what to do. We could do so much with it. So I'm hoping for that, for the future of the archives here at Trudeau. We're here on our next stop at Black Diamond Mines Regional Preserve inside the trailer that has been here since the late 1970s, early 1980s. And for the most part was where the archives for the district were born. So let's come on inside. This is one of the main workstations where volunteers and staff worked for many years, putting in the information into a database past perfect. In the past couple of years, we've been transferring all that information into a proficio, which is the district-wide database, and make sure that everything that's here is backed up into the cloud, which it had never been before. Turn this way uh, into one of, uh, there's uh, a few of these cabinets. Uh, and each one is, is separated out by material. This one is the organics yeah, but, um, material. And in here you'll get um, boots and shoes, things that may have been found in the parks. All of them have a great labeling system incorporated into the database. This is why we've always said that this is where the archives were born for the district. 
And then over here is a slide viewing machine. There's just a few of these in the district, but I think it could have some potential for an exhibit. Children and or people would love to see these and see the slides lighting up. So we, we're keeping it for now. From here is an example of a place that's not here. Artifacts that have been collected from other parks that started to come here. Just from somebody around Vasco Caves and started picking up items and donated them. A lot of these artifacts have signed releases through donors. They rely on us, they trust us to keep these items. Now, I'm very excited to share cassette tapes. They're all our original oral histories, all digitized now from way back to the early 2000s. That was a project that the archives department had first worked on, so we're very excited that those are digitized. So here's another one of these artifact cabinets. I'm going to just pull this over here. So some of the metal objects that we have here, all identified and labeled. These are mostly artifacts that were found here at either the Nortonville or the Summersville town sites. We walk further back into here. Most of this is oversized items. There could be some unprocessed finds here. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> and donations that still need to be entered into the systems. And here, this is 1980, a group of UC Berkeley students and a professor who came to the Nortonville Somerville sites and did a lot of archaeological collections that we have here. I'm getting very hot in here. And I will say that it is a very warm summer day here at Black Diamond Mines. The air conditioning unit has been broken and the majority of the time when there's not staff inside of here, it's getting very, very warm. We're also standing on not even uh, ground. Uh, the, the trailer is leaning this way a little bit. What we want so badly is to find a way to rehouse this place, whether it is to think of a new facility, incorporate it into the Trudeau archives, but to find a place for these items to stay safe. There are many treasures here, and we would like to see them blast into the future to be accessible and preserved for future generations. Welcome inside one of the bunkers at Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, home of the Port Chicago 50. Uh, we are figuring out if this is an appropriate place to store artifacts. These two buggies are from the Nortonville site at Black Diamond Mines. They were uh, donated. Towards this side, um, we have some items that are from here. Uh, this is the Concord Naval Weapons Station archives and artifacts transferred over from the Concord Historical Society. We are working currently on making an official ownership of these materials from the Navy. Um, they could have some potential for exhibitry. Uh, and but we still will need to decide where they're going to be stored. Right now they're here because they're oversized and they fit great. Um, we have signs from all different eras dating back from the 1930s, including Mare Island, uh, up until the 1990s. So here's one from 1957. This is one of uh, what we believe was a blasting door. And here is the cover to a time capsule. They did this pretty close to when they closed the weapon station. And the opening date is 2042. Maybe someday we'll have an event and, and open it up in 2042. Over here are bins. The final go through of the Murphy Ranch houses at Round Valley. We did collect the last that was in the house and we have all different eras all the way through to the early 2000s. So here are some really historically significant yearbooks from the schools that the families attended. Um, one thing that touched me here was that there was a women's school in San Jose that were teaching two family members that we know of who came back and became teachers in the Brentwood Valley. Uh, we have school books from the children of the Murphy family dated from the late 1800s that have their names written in the inside covers. And then we also have letters and photographs 
into the 60s and 70s, and a hesitancy to just get rid of them, or as we say, deaccession, is that there's longer letters inside that have a lot of stories and information about the family, but there's also the experiences of agricultural life across from Stockton to here. Many photographs that have identification on the back of who they are and where they came from, something that we just shouldn't throw away. So these are inventory and um, cataloged. And the last two items that I wanted to show from the Murphy Ranch, this was taken from the um, porch gate uh, from the Murphy home. And as you can see, there's the M, and it just has a feel of um, bringing you back to a time where it's the family pride. And last, we discovered that this case was used by the women who were attending the San Jose school because we found school material that was in here. So they probably used this case to travel back and forth from San Jose. Finally, we have these two pianos, um, which were quite a feat to get into this bunker. Many of the family members were musicians and played the piano. This one, it was in the living room. And we know for sure that this is dates from the 1800s and was probably a centerpiece for the family that made those many years. This one had a note uh, that we found that said it was from a lodge in, in the Brentwood area. Whether we keep these, we're partnering with Black Diamond Mines Visitor Center to talk about what kind of history do we want to tell from the Round Valley area. And that's what's in here. We are here at the Burrell property in Danville, which will be a future park. This is the farmhouse and we're gonna go inside and see what's in there. As you can see, the family did not get rid of a lot and they kept it all. And we need to start figuring out what we're going to keep and not keep. The Burrell family, they started their American experience in Oakland, California. Joseph Burrell had a, a tire company in downtown Oakland. We have a reminder tag to change your oil, gas prices, and ledger books showing the number of hours that he worked. Here we have Louis Flights, Maria Flights' relative, and that's how Joseph and Maria got together. There's a lot of experiences here from the East Bay, brochures from old villages and neighborhoods that probably no longer exist, a postcard from Mount Shasta from 1940, and we even have a brochure of the East Bay Regional Park District opening. So it's fun to imagine that possibly the Burrell family went to this celebration. And we found picture books from different eras. Armand and his mother and father were very interested in travel and different stories. Maria from Germany and Joseph from France. I think that this story of World War II was heavy on their minds and they kept things. Here are actual war ration books we have Maria's and we have Armand's. There's a full collection of life magazines and books about World War II. And at first you would think, well, we don't need these. They're out of date and before the internet. But when I was looking through these books, it feels like I had never seen some of these photos that are in here. The stories in here are very touching and, you know, they, they, they affect you and gives you more of a sense of wonder to see it in a book like this. This is how people would have learned about real history. We also have Armand's military service cards from the 1950s. He was in Japan at that time. How do we keep this or do we keep this? Would somebody be interested in it? We would love to be able to tell a story that's connected to these types of records. The collection is eclectic and wide ranging. We have records that work on a Vitrola and the original playlists. They had to handwrite everything back then. We have books that are in French. This is a medicine book talking about different ailments and cures. 
tickets for the key system with all of the different routes in Oakland. There's also a toy Golden Gate Bridge wood building blocks that was most likely one of Armand's toys and many little items that could be for display for an exhibit but maybe not for the park district. I'm very excited to be a part of the visioning team or the group that's talking about what's going to happen here and I'm hoping that the archives can help with calling through this material keeping what we think is important about the history and then finding new and better, even better homes for the material that we don't want. We are here at our last stop on the virtual tour, Sunol Visitor Center. Let's go inside. So we're inside the barn and this cabinet has collected many histories that the naturalists have used for years in their programs photographs, family memorabilia about the former ranch owners, the Brinkers and the Geary's and other family here in Sunol. There's also some recordation of what databases Sunol has kept. So a pretty old fireproof cabinet. So there is a concern if this building at some point were compromised, it would take a half hour for the material in here to start disintegrating. So inside the shed, there are artifacts in here. Most of them have identification cards attached to them, which is wonderful. Shows the history of where it was found. We are willing to work alongside the cultural services coordinator to get these items recorded. But as you can see, there's many other artifacts to study and find a better way to store rather than in this shed. So we've come to the end of our virtual tour. It is time for us to think about how we want to put together a central database, a district-wide archives that can help staff and be an opportunity for the public to explore, not just hiking and bicycling, but also exploring it in its history. Thank you very much for joining me. Well, so I'm sorry, I'm going to go uh, uh, right into the uh, presentation of the uh, slides. And these are for the uh, um, report recommendations for the needs assessment. Um, this uh, needs assessment report was uh, compiled in, uh, it was completed in 2020, uh, but the uh, ONDA consultants, uh, the uh, consultants had did it over a couple of years uh, the existing conditions report, which was going across the um, the district and uh, collecting as much information as they could about the existing conditions of the archives at the district. So these were the recommendations. There's 14 of them. Um, I've separated them out in themes, visibility and accessibility, collections management, sustainability, and the oral history program. And then of course, a mention about the positions. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, each section here uh, individually. Um, oh, so the one that has like the square box, uh, those um, I can see uh, within the next year or two, we're going to be able to either get them going or completed or started. Um, and then the ones that are, have the um, little snowflake on there are something that to just kind of look at um, for the future. Uh, and and where where we should go with those, right. so visibility and accessibility. Um, uh, I'm very excited to show this top left corner here, a right corner. I'm sorry of this um, blank page, but it's our website. It's our web page to put collections um, uh, online, and we're going to try to see if we can't get something going uh, for our at least our district staff to be able to access this uh, collection database. We would be uploading uh, the items that we have in Proficio, as well as some of the oral histories in our uh, oral history master list and, and see how uh, this collection um, module will work. Uh, this also will be uh, something that people will click on in our website, uh, the EB Parks website, uh, and be able to click on that and get uh, uh, access into this um, database. 
Uh, so I'm very excited. This uh, took a long time to get and to get here. Um, and uh, Proficio is uh, supporting us in in um, in doing this this web this web uh, access. Uh, and so the other recommendation is the establishment of a archives research center and museum. And the report had a couple of recommendations for that. One was to think of a uh, gateway to the parks idea. Um, they used the Henry J. Kaiser building, but at the time that the report was released, the building was still um, being uh, considered for other uses. Uh, so other than its convention use, convention center use. So um, at the time they used that as an example of bringing uh, a building or a facility that's within a, within an urban environment that would point people to the parks, point people to to what's uh, uh, in our area. And they, they thought of a focus on, on watersheds. Um, and then now uh, we also, all of our archives facilities are within the parks uh, right now. Um, and then of course there is the potential of the Thurgood Marshall Regional Park, home of the Port Chicago 50, um, partnership with the National Park Service on an archives building there at um, Thurgood Marshall. Um, but my biggest concern is that's, that's years from now and we have uh, concerns now, now that we need to deal with. Um, and as far as collection, collections management, uh, we are in the middle of working on a record schedule. Uh, it was really helpful to recently review a draft um, records retention policy that uh, the clerk of the board and district council are working on so that I can have a better idea. I've also was able to provide um, some input uh, on the policy. So I was really excited about that. And um, uh, grateful that they they asked me and I and accepted some of my comments. Um, so what we're trying to do is find a way to uh, communicate to to field staff to our staff about some of the issues that they have. There you see these pictures around here. These are actually boxes of artifacts and and records and things that are hanging out in different facilities across the uh, park district and we'd really like to be able to help um, staff uh, do that. Uh, one of the other recommendations is assigning staff at each visitor center or department that would actually be part of our connection to um, uh, make sure that records come to the archives and or we can help with some of the records that they need to to cull through. Um, and then uh, there is the uh, recommendation to have a district-wide plan to manage historic structures. I think that that will probably be something to partner with Anna Marie uh, Guerrero, who's in a picture above, and of course with stewardship and planning, um, as uh, this is something that they're that is there more on their focus. And then um, there's the sustainability, and uh, in the top right corner. Uh, image is the map of the Trudeau Center uh, bottom floor and where the uh, archives are located in the light blue and in the computer lab where the areas that we have been using recently. Um, due to the pandemic, um, the computer lab and of course prior to the, the pandemic, the computer lab was uh, having less and less use. Um, a lot of uh, virtual access is, is, um, has caused it to be a, a little bit less necessary for people to gather and come to use computers in a computer lab. Um, however, we're still continuing to work with IS and facilities management on, um, on our space needs there, but we have some you know, great um, resources. There is a, an ODA project uh, that's with the archives that has a, a good amount of money and resources for, for us. Um, there, we're constantly, in fact, after the virtual tour, we actually went through the um, magazine or bunker. I like to call it a bunker. I don't know why, but uh, we went through and uh, cleaned up the bunker, um, fixed some wire meshing that was uh, uh, damaged uh, on the ceiling here that there were droppings coming out, moved the buggies so they weren't directly underneath it um, and uh, cleaned up and um, scooted out a family of uh, <laughs> a mom and dad and three little mice um, and since we've done that, we've not seen any rodent um, rodents return 
Um, I think it was, we just had a lot of organic material laying around since we've since um, gotten rid of. And we are uh, really wanting to uh, work closely with the IS department and make sure that they know um, our concerns for digital material. Um, that's not only the stuff that we scan um, and that we have electronic records of, and that includes, you know, the oral history interviews, which are, you know, huge files. Um, and, but that's also the born digital material, the, all the graphics and, and um, reports and, and records that are being created that don't ever see paper anymore. So, you know, like it's, it's, it's talking about that. It's talking about how we're going to, to deal with those, those records um, as we move into the future. And as well as, you know, when the, the policy for the um, records retention schedule comes, um, how are we going to um, manage what we scan uh, and, um, uh, and shred and, and stuff. So what, how things are going to be kept. And, you know, ultimately, a disaster preparedness. Uh, last night, um, I was here putting away hard drives and shoving them in um, the uh, fireproof cabinets here, just uh, doing my own uh, little uh, disaster preparedness just in case uh, of because of the heat and, um, uh, you know, the, the fire threats that are, that are currently going around here. So I um, definitely would like to go um, explore that in the future. Um, success story, the oral history program were, um, were well-funded and I thank the, um, uh, board of directors and, um, our management staff for, for supporting that and, and getting the uh, appropriate, uh, amount of budget money in there. I feel really good about that this year. Um, we did a really, uh, extensive interview with Doug McConnell. Um, and we just recently interviewed Ruth Orta, who's here in this photo, um, uh, and, uh, so we, we feel uh, like we have a great partnership with the Bancroft Library, but we also have access to really great videographers like Chris Lynn Chu, who did this, the video for the virtual tour um, and other um, uh, people that could, could interview and, and get people's uh, histories. Um, and as far as uh, positions, um, I put a, this symbol, <laughs> which means I think, I think that I'm, as the archives program supervisor, this is kind of uh, the, um, the type of management that they wanted for the department. And I'm, I'm for the most part, um, uh, cobbling away at some of these other positions as, as part of the supporting the department, but it's still a staff of one. Um, there is uh, uh, some hope for the future uh, with some uh, uh, budget requests as we uh, establish uh, clear uh, job descriptions that um, will support the part uh, archives and uh, we're, we are looking to put uh, we do have those on the budget for 2023 and of course I can't say enough about the volunteers um, that are support me they're here in this picture working in the computer lab um, as well as the contractors such as uh, Thomas Nelson um, and now the students. So we've been working, I just got an email today from uh, Cal Berkeley, uh, the introduction to the natural cultural resources uh, class. That's the last C on there. Um, they, uh, they are going to be uh, hopefully working with me again uh, for this uh, fall semester. And um, I'm really excited about this. Uh, this, I hope, addresses a little bit about the objects curator position. And it's something that I have been talking with the consultants who wrote the needs assessment report um, of uh, partnering with a, a master's program. So I, I, I reached out to uh, the Medi Me museum studies program at the University of San Francisco um, just recently, and uh, they're on board. Uh, they would like to s explore this opportunity I would uh, need to work on developing a scope of work um, and a budget, uh, and maybe we could get some of these uh, muse museum studies uh, um, students, uh, master's students uh, in here and, and help with some of the curation. Um, uh, ideally, these uh, items that are in the garage, um, the Burrell uh, items and things like that to start determining their um, 
uh, either preservation uh, and uh, recordation, like actually getting them in a database and uh, photographed. And then these are the additional considerations and um, just the status. Uh, I'm excited. I got the Archives and Cultural Resources Staff Advisory Group together this year. Um, and I thank everybody who's been in the uh, meetings and we need to have more meetings. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it, uh, um, I do need to plan one soon. And I'd like to do that before our next uh, 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 committee meeting um, to discuss some of the things that we've done this year or looked at. Uh, and one was looking at a, an oral history selection criteria document. That is uh, something that came up earlier about trying to have more of a policy towards um, how we select our oral histories and, um, and another success, we're, we're on um, the online archives of California, we're um, on internet archives and we um, received that grant through California Revealed. So we're trying to get uh, some type of presence on the web. It's, it's tiny, but it's a start. Um, and then of course, uh, we're looking at other um, online software services like Preservica and Archive Space, which are both uh, in the report. Um, and they're both um, uh, uh, online services that uh, nationwide they're they're um, they're highly supported, and there's a lot of people connected into those um, softwares. And then um, also the support on the district-wide records retention policy. So we've reviewed a draft of it. The archives were, had the opportunity to do so. Um, so uh, and I also had discussions with the OMDA consultants, and the the two that are in the future are two issues that I hope some of this will resolve from the field trip video, uh, the field uh, virtual tour video, as well as um, some of the database items that we're trying to do. But the siloed park collections that we have so many collections uh, hidden away um, at, at park sites in a shed at Sunol, uh, and and how are we making those accessible, not just to, um, not so that they're just for that naturalist staff that work at the visitor center, but could expand out to district wide. And hopefully some of those items actually um, are accessible for the public as well. And then uh, they have also uh, a recommendation or a consideration about our uh, too many tractors. Um, there are a lot of uh, field and farm equipment uh, out there at, in our parks. And um, how are we working on those preservation needs? I think that might also fall under um, some of the issues that we have at, at the Burrell property. And that is the end of my presentation. This is just another overview of um, uh, the recommendations. Shops share. Well, thank you so much, Brenda. I love that video tour. Oh, good. <laughs> hard to do it all in 15 minutes, wasn't it? It was very difficult. Yes. <laughs> it was a, a great, uh, it was good to learn. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad to have had that experience. And um, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting rid of the mice there is always good. Um, I guess I want to know is why don't we have air conditioning <laughs> in the black diamond i mean it's been a couple of years i think and those are some of our original collections i think and that level of heat has to be destroying them so so how do we make that happen well i th i there was the idea and it was part of that oda project um, was that there, it could be enveloped into another collection. And one was that it would come here to Trudeau in the interim. But that vast of a collection uh, to be in the interim is, uh, is, is a, a big concept to, to deal with. Um, the other, there is, a, there is an air conditioning unit there at the trailer, but it doesn't work very well. Um, and, it's, um, and it's also reliant on power. So if the power goes out, that goes out. And uh, uh, 
I understand even here at Trudeau, we had a power outage this weekend. So I don't know for how long or, or what have you, but we do, we do have that issue that um, the majority of our sites do not have any backup generating power either. Yeah, but I mean, this is this has been years. <laughs> I, I don't really understand that. Yeah. Uh, I I just think that's bizarre. Um, well, and I I appreciate this report so much, and I I think um, we need to figure out some way to um, uh, have the rest of the board see this video. Um, Colin, do you have any suggestions about how, how that can get shared with the rest of the board? Brenda, it looked to me like you had it on YouTube. I do. Yes. Yeah, so she needs to only um, send a link to us, to the YouTube site. Okay. And, would, and that would be just available to us, right? Not to the public. Yeah, so um, it's or it's on an un to the public. It's on an unlisted channel, and I did film it so that the locations were general enough that no one would really know, <laughs> like no one's going to know what bunker to or magazine to go to at uh, Thurgood Marshall. Um, and we tried to make you know some of the other areas generic enough um, that people wouldn't know specifically where these locations are. Um, so, but I, it's definitely unlisted on, on, on my YouTube channel. So uh, I could share it and it could just go to the board for now, if you would like. And then if it need, I think because this is a public meeting, I should be okay to share to the public. I'm not sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. I do that. Right. If, I, if, if we've discussed at a meeting an issue someone's interested in, I'll send them a link to the YouTube site. Correct, yes. And that's, that's very public. So, yes. Okay, I hope you're comfortable with that going to the public. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, you know, I, you know, I, I, yes, I'm, I'm okay. I, there's, there, so far it's, uh, I, I think I intended it that it would be a public, that the public would be able to view this without any cultural resources being compromised. Hey, Brenda, you're doing great as a, a narrator and, and uh, interviewer, and uh, you, you're just uh, coming coming along real well, getting that done, getting down how to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Watching Doug McConnell. Yeah. So if you would send um, to the rest of the board a link, uh, and say that that was something our committee requested. Yes. And others can just find it as they may. Um, okay, so Colin, do you have any questions or comments for this? Uh, well, the comment is it, it, it's wonderful that the program is uh, getting this much attention. Uh, I, I appreciate that immensely and it's having great success, but what it points out is you have a lot of problems too. And, uh, and uh, you're, um, but you know, you got your arms around them now. So tell me uh, who did this assessment and who was the intended audience for that assessment? Uh, so the assessment, um, the history of it and briefly is, uh, that it came about from uh, uh, Bev Ortiz, who was the cultural services coordinator at the time, and Kate Collins, who was the supervising naturalist at Black Diamond, and myself, who um, were being uh, approached to uh, front by the board to say, hey, we've got this contingency money and we want to spend it on the archives, but we didn't really know all that we had. And we uh, suggested through Kate and Beverly, Bev and I were to have a, a needs assessment or a, an ex existing conditions report so that we could ha actually know because we, none of us in our capacity, I wasn't even archives pro program supervisor at the time. I was admin analyst for the public affairs. Um, none of us were the archivists for the park district really. Um, and 
so, but we knew we needed this. And so that was this existing conditions report. And then on top of that, they did a list of recommendations in the needs assessment. Um, the uh, consultants are, um, uh, they're called the Onda consultants. And one uh, was the archivist or the head of the department of the, um, uh, of, uh, the uh, environmental design um, archives at uh, UC Berkeley. And they're both very um, prominent in the field uh, with the uh, Society of California Archivists and the um, Society of American Archivists. So um, there are many people who know who they are. They've done a lot of other consulting work with parks, uh, national parks. Uh, so uh, they they see, they're very familiar with with what the, our issues were and what they saw. And and since then, I've actually retained their services uh, because. Uh, there isn't a lot of um, uh, expertise and at uh, staff expertise in, at the park district to bounce these things off of, so I felt like I still needed that that archivist archives consulting uh, to guide me so that I could uh, make better decisions. Yeah, and, and so this was done. Let's see, pre-COVID, so to five the, five years ago. The final report was issued in 2020. And at the time, the report was intended for um, review by management and uh, an executive, the executive team. Uh, and, and then I, I believe it started trickling out to the board as, uh, as interest uh, came about. But, but the report ha is kind of limited other than that. I do share it with the, uh, the um, staff advisory group. It is available for, for review. By anyone, um, so. Uh, uh, but other than that, it's it's been, it's been my bible here, <laughs> for the most part, just to make sure I'm, I'm prioritizing in a an appropriate way here at the archives. So, Colin, if you haven't seen a copy of it, I'm sure you could request one. I especially like their plan to have the. Kaiser Center become our museum. And I don't know if you're familiar with that building. I'm not at all. It, it's large. Is it it's, available? <laughs> <laughs> it's um, uh, next to the Oakland Museum, you know, not far oh, from okay. Lake Merritt. And um, it, you know, I, I don't know what's happening with it right now. It's, it's a building that belongs to Oakland and um, I don't know how old it is, but I thought it was truly visionary <laughs> to talk about that whole thing being um, uh, a museum and archives. Yeah, I'd love to get a copy of the uh, assessment, friend. Sure. Yes, and, and they have other examples too in their uh, models yeah. Of, yeah. of other uh, places and, and what other um, agencies have done. And I, I asked specifically for them to include, you know, the California state parks and national parks, um, uh, park agencies, uh, uh, as a, some of the, the items that we deal with are, are unique to park agencies, I think, um, and, and dealing with things that are outside in the field um, and, and, and exposed um, most of the time. Okay, well, I really appreciate the report and um, I'm good. I'm glad we're doing a request from it for some additional staff. I mean, it's clear uh, one person really can't handle this, um, no matter how glorious the volunteers are. And um, I think I'm sending out an email on this air conditioning at Black Diamond. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because really, it's Black Diamond, and that's a very hot place. And I'm not even talking about now. Two years, my gosh. Okay. All right. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to add a, a, a thought that occurred to me while listening to all the different angles you're coming from. You know, you got your physical materials, you've got your uh, things that are transcripts, you've got uh, photos, you, you're just coming at this with all sorts of 
different directions and you're figuring out how to make it available to the public, either in a museum setting or an online setting. And one of the organizational thoughts I had was that uh, our, our parks, and you learn this as a board member and you spend time out in the park, our, each of our parks has a, a, a fan club. They may not be organized, but there are people who are just huge fans of, of that particular park and you run into them all the time. And I'm thinking those will be the folks that will be most interested in having access to all of this um, when it's relevant to their park. And we have parks like Tilden with tremendous history. And Tilden has a tremendous fan base. Uh, and I'm just thinking that if this all could be accomplished and, and uh, direction given in some way online, um, for instance, I'm a, I'm a Tilden enthusiast. I, I go to the Tilden web, website on ebparks.org. Someday there ought to be a little place to click to get to the Tilden-based history, that resources that we have. And uh, it's just an organizational thought. And of course, you know, where, where there are visitor centers, uh, there, there should be a lot of thought given to the museum concept that visitors centers uh, can provide. And certainly that uh, exists at Tilden. Um, the other is thought that came to mind is um, Brian, who I think is here, I saw him on there, um, told us yesterday in relation to the uh, Director Lane's question about um, name, naming trails and uh, whether Native American uh, names can be given to trails. Uh, it can, but how and when and how, how we are sensitive to that issue. But during that discussion, Brian said, we have a tremendous record with each park uh, as to their Native American histories. And we keep that, there's a lot of sensitive information there that we keep to ourselves. But it occurs to me that, that, you know, that that's been curated in the, with the, this would be something Anna Maria would have most knowledge about, I guess. But um, again, think in relationship to specific parks of creating access to the Native American history that is relevant to that park. Um, we learned during the uh, Naval Weapons Station naming process about the Chupcon. I learned a lot about the Chupcon during that process and uh, that, that I didn't know before. And it was relate, in relation specifically to that park that uh, spurred that interest in uh, my learning about it. Uh, so that kind of connection per park should also be thought about. So th those are just two thoughts that came to mind. And lastly, there is, um, one, uh, one thing I've been concerned about for years, and um, I don't know that, I've talked to Jim O'Connor about it on a number of occasions. I don't know if I ever talked to you about it, but I'm, I have you here, so I'm just gonna take a, a minute. And that is, you recall back at, when you toured the Port Costa Brickyard, there's that brick mural just out in the open, deteriorating, and I don't know who can, can do something about that, but that thing needs to be preserved. And uh, I, I, I don't know who, who exactly to talk to, but maybe you are uh, in the vicinity of that <laughs> discussion. This, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. I do. And we tried to uh, uh, find the history of that uh, mural. And uh, we when we talked to Chuck Messina, he said he doesn't even recall that mural existing when the factory was there. So I'm curious about that too. Um, it might have to take some more digging about um, how that um, mural came there. Um, as we, we still are kind of in a, a murky place about where, where it came from and what, what it was symbolizing. Um, but um, I agree, it's, uh, it's a beautiful mural. Um, and I, th I, you know, my, I mean, because I'm a, a department of one, I, I mean, partnerships are always my thing or trying to reach out and see 
um, who might be interested in it um, other than the park district um, on, on helping to get it restored. So. Terrific. Thanks. It's just a personal interest. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Uh, Beverly. Okay. Thank you. And wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. There's, there's much more we could do, but we better move on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for preparing this and for sending that um, video to people. Thank you, Director Lee. All right. Um, and Sabrina, are there any public comments on this um, item? Not hearing any come. Let's turn to the next item. I'm sorry, Director Lane. There were no no public comments. I apologize for the. I, I thought that was pretty likely. Okay, so let's look at the, an update on Anthony Chabot's former uh, gun club and the remediation that um, is being planned. Matt would be, uh, Matt? Yeah, direct line, yes, direct line. Um, okay. I'm here, I'm getting around, I'm trying to pull the slides up. Huh, it's not sharing the way I want to. Okay, there, I think this will work. Here we go. Okay. All right, thank you, um, members of the committee. It's Matt Grawl, Chief of Stewardship, and I'm here today with uh, Michelle King, uh, one of our consultants from EKI, who's been um, conducting the, the site investigation for the Chabot Gun Club. And the former Chabot Gun Club, former Anthony Chabot Markmanship Range, um, also called the Chabot Gun Club, uh, as they were the operator of the range for many years. Um, but today we're gonna give you an update on that site. Um, and, um, and we're running a little bit short on time um, just because we're late on, a little bit late on the agenda. So I'm gonna run through some of this quickly because I believe Michelle's gonna have to leave soon. So Michelle's gonna do what she can before she has to leave and then I'll, I'll finish it up. But, um, but we're gonna talk about a background, a little bit of background on the gun club because I believe this site was closed um, before Director Coffey was on, on the board of directors. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the history, results of the ongoing uh, site, or the results of the completed site investigation and the next steps for the ecological risk assessment that needs to be conducted and the human health risk assessment. And then that will lead into a feasibility study and a remedial action plan for this site. Just FYI, Matt, I was serving on the PAC and, and attended a lot of meetings on the gun club at the PAC. That's a good reminder. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I know the history. Okay, good. And yeah, and the PAC was very involved in some of those um, actions. So you do have a good background. So thanks for that um, part. So yeah, so the, the range though was, it was started in 1963 in cooperation with the Oakland Pistol Club. Then the, the district had a long-term lease with the Chevelle Gun Club for 25 years. And then we looked to renew that lease. We did, there was a short-term renewal and then we looked at the long-term renewal. And, and during that, we really realized in order to keep operating this, we would need to have a stormwater treatment system because in about 2008, the water board investigated the site and said, to keep operating a gun club here, you need to have an industrial stormwater permit and have it, um, the site managed under that industrial stormwater permit. And so we, we were doing that from 2008 and we looked at renewing the lease. We were looking at what it was going to take to continue operating that. And, and under that industrial permit, we were um, very close to being required to put in a treatment system. And so we even budgeted for that treatment system. Even with the club being closed, we were planning to implement that treatment system. Um, but then in 2016, after the club, we, we did not renew the lease and then they left the club. It changed how we were able to operate the site. So we were ne never had to implement that treatment system because we were able to then pond water on the ranges. And, and that's what we've been doing um, since the club left um, and operating the, the, the marksmanship range. We've been holding stormwater on the site. And so, um, and, and so we don't have the same level of lead leaving the site that was uh, while the club was in operation. So that's helped keep us in compliance with the industrial permit and reduce the cost for, for managing stormwater. Um, but I think the main reason that we wanted to update you today on where we are is too, is because we're going to have a few contracts coming to the board um, in, in, on September 20th um, to continue some of the st ongoing stormwater monitoring that we're doing and the stormwater management, and then also to do the, for the next steps of this project. 
um, which will be the ecological risk assessment. So we've been having ongoing uh, meetings with the regional board um, throughout, starting in January 2020 and throughout the last year and a half two, or two years. Um, and we, so we've been working with the board on, on, on these investigations and they approved this current plan and have reviewed all the results you're seeing today. So um, then this, this figure shows kind of the site layout, just to remember how the site was oriented. There were these various firing ranges um, throughout. And, and so after the club was closed in 2016, we removed all the, the structures um, on, on the site and, um, and basically cleaned the surface up and brought, removed a lot of the uh, materials and storage areas. Um, but we didn't do anything to the, the soil because of the known lead contamination. So now Michelle can talk very briefly, I think, about um, some of the uh, data they've collected on the status of the site. Yeah, thank you, Matt. And uh, my apologies that I really only have five minutes and I have to get on another call, but um, I'll do my best. So uh, we started the site investigations. We did it in two, two rounds over the summers of uh, 2020 and 2021. And we focused on the range floors and the, the base of the berm. So basically the flat areas, we did groundwater sampling. And then we looked in what we call the overshot area. So that's people that are shooting high up in the forested areas above the ranges. And then there's a creek that runs um, basically the stormwater that does actually ultimately discharge, does run into an unnamed tributary. And so we, that ultimately feeds to Lake Chabot. So we wanted to look at that. And then there's other miscellaneous areas or drainage ditch buildings and so forth. And um, basically the chemicals of potential concern are primarily lead is the main one. There's other range metals like arsenic and antimony and a few other metals. And then the clay pigeons from um, you know, the skeet and trap range have PAHs in it. So those are the main concerns. And in this presentation, we'll focus really on the lead. And just imagine that there was, you know, more than 50 years of, you know, basically pistol range gun club use out at the site. So next slide, Matt. So this is just one example of some of the sampling that we did. And this is on the range floor. Um, the firing would happen from the, whoops, would happen from uh, basically the bottom of the picture where it's sort of the whiter color across to uh, the area where it's kind of light brown and there would be target berms set up and the different orange lines or different target lines that would be set up over time. And then in the gray uh, little bubbles are concentrations of lead. And those are in milligrams per kilogram or parts per million. And those are measured you know, either in the lab or with a field instrument. And for just by comparison, a residential cleanup standard would be 80 and a commercial cleanup standard would be 500. Uh, ecological cleanup standard would potentially fall somewhere in between. So you can see the concentrations are well, well above uh, these types of standards and not surprising given the decades of, of use. And generally contamination ranges from about a half to one foot thick, depending on where you are in the range. Next slide, Matt. Okay, just a second. I'm... There we go. Okay. So one of the things that the water board was definitely interested in was uh, whether there were impacts from the lead and range uses to groundwater. And so we tried to sample groundwater at five different locations, but it's bedrock, uh, not too far below the ground surface. And so we were really only able to collect water samples from two of the locations, the ones that are colored in blue. And the good news was that we did not find lead impacts or PAH impacts only uh, some arsenic was detected in groundwater at levels that are generally believed to be consistent with background or not the primary um, you know, range metal that was out there. So that was good news because it means that we will not have to deal with cleanup of groundwater at the site. Okay, next slide. Then we um, looked up you know, in the forested areas, what we call the overshot areas. And we did these transects basically marching deep into the forest, it was very, very thick to get through, and we're measuring uh, lead and in, in near the trap, skeet and trap range, measuring also the um, weight of the lead pellets that we found. And again, if you think of that comparison number of a commercial number of, of 500 for lead, you can see we were way up, you know, hundreds of feet into the forest and we're still finding very, very high concentrations of lead. So these impacts are very widespread. Um, and then with that, we, um, if you want to move to the next slide, Matt, we then uh, said, well, let's go to the least boundary and see did the firing. Now, you, you know, you see how zoomed out we are. You can see the light brown of the range floors. 
and we went all the way to the leasehold boundary and still found ricocheted ammunition out at the boundaries and in some cases some high lead right at the leasehold boundary. So um, these impacts are not localized, they're, they're very widespread uh, all through uh, the forested area. And they're also somewhat on the hillside that's to the south of the ranges as well. Um, you can see a little picture of the ricocheted bullet um, just to show you what that actually looks like. Matt, you wanna go to the next slide? And then we looked um, in the creek. So you can see these orange uh, circles are areas where we collected samples of sediment. We did a few more closer into the range, but you can see the leasehold boundary in the dashed line. And then at the very bottom of the slide, you can see where these Grass Valley Creek feeds into Lake Chabot, which ultimately is a secondary source of drinking water. And you can see very close to the um, lease boundary, the concentrations of lead are pretty high, around 500 to 1600, and ppm is the same as milligrams per kilogram. So it's all the same units. And then you can see as you go down that unnamed tributary, how the concentrations of lead decrease. Um, but most importantly, that when you get to Grass Valley Creek, the concentrations of lead in the sediment were basically at background levels. So although there's impacts that do go down this unnamed tributary, it doesn't look like at this stage that there's sediment impacts that would go all the way down to Lake Chabot. Next slide. So what are the overall findings that, you know, you probably heard the story, but groundwater is not impacted, which is great. Um, the range floors were definitely significantly impacted and in some cases as thick as two feet near the target berms. Um, generally at the edges of the ranges, the impacts are thinner. Um, one thing I didn't mention so much about are the PAHs, and that's found in the, ski, the clay pigeon fragments that were basically spread by the, by the gun club, probably used to winterize you know, so surfaces and things like that. But you can find the fragments ground up and spread throughout. So those, uh, the impacts are pretty widespread from the skeet debris. And then um, in the overshot areas, as you saw from those uh, maps, that the uh, impacts go all the way to the leasehold boundary. And then with the creek, it uh, really, it seems to be limited to the unnamed tributary, but does not impact Grass Valley Creek. Um, with that, I'm gonna probably hand it over to Matt. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, uh, directors Lane and Coffee, my apologies for having to leave, but thank you. Yeah, and thanks, Michelle. And um, yeah, I'll take it from here. And then, um, and, and if we have any, if there are any follow-up questions we have trouble answering, we'll certainly reach out. Uh, yeah, and I can always be available at another time, yeah. thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks. Michelle. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so yes, so then our, our site investigation report, the report on everything we just submitted was submitted to the Water Board. They did approve um, uh, of that report and they agree that we don't need to do any other further characterization um, to determine the extent of the lead um, at this time. So the next step will then to be to, to kick off an ecological risk assessment. So now we have the, the data, we need to take that um, the data on the soil concentrations and look at um, how it, it may create risk, ecological risks. And so the ecological are gonna really be the driver for remediation and not necessarily human health, um, because we really have to make sure that we're not gonna have um, long go ongoing impacts to the environment um, first. Um, and so that will be the draft ERI work plan uh, is currently, it's under internal review. We're planning to submit that to the water board very soon and get their approval. We did already have a meeting with them just about our approach to the ecological risk assessment and the human health risk assessment, and they did agree with the approach. So um, we just need to get them the technical details of that uh, study plan and, uh, and then get their approval. Uh, but then after we do the ecological, some of this will be happening in parallel, but and then we'll also be doing a human health risk assessment. And so this will um, calculate the risk-based remedial goals that will be used to establish the cleanup levels for the site contaminants that make sure we're protective of human health. Um, and we'll also identify the potential exposed populations that would contact the soil. So really that's based on the use of the site. So who is using the site and what is the potential for them to contact that soil? And if they did, then what is the risk of that exposure? So, and how can we limit that exposure? So that information will, will be used to develop, to do a, feed into a feasibility study and a remedial action plan that um, basically the, the, the triggers we evaluate in the human health risk assessment and the ecological risk assessment or are the, are the risk, I should say, associated with lead will be used to um, make sure we put in controls and, um, and methods in place to make sure that the future use of that site doesn't allow um, humans to come into contact with that, uh, those high uh, lead concentrations. So there's a variety of, uh, of methods that could be used, but it really depends on the 
site conditions um, in each location on what we choose to use. So there, um, but the feasibility study will help develop what those tools need to be um, as far as the remedial actions. So, so there's a wide range of remedial actions. Um, and then this next slide shows what some of those could be. Um, and so the, so the potential remedial actions are removing soil and disposing off site. That'll be the most expensive. And in, and in some areas of the site uh, on the upper areas of the ranges, and you saw in those forested areas, that's not really, that's not gonna be feasible. That's within the overshot areas and range eight. It's so vegetated and so um, hard to access those areas. Um, we're gonna need to look at other methods in those areas, likely fencing and things like that. Um, also, um, the creek um, could be very expensive. And so we're gonna have to assess the ecological risk of, of removing sediments from that creek with um, the, the amount of, of lead that's there and determine if that is, is a feasible action. It could be more damaging to, to remove the sediments from the creek to allow them to remain in place. But that will be something that we'll have to evaluate and, and have the water board make a determination on, on, on what we should do in that area. Um, then also we'll be looking at the opportunity for consolidating and the impacted soil uh, and capping it and, and doing some stormwater management. That is probably one of the most likely scenarios uh, for most of the range um, of just the range floors, the target berm areas, those areas will, will be um, likely will want to do some consolidation because the, the lead in those areas is, um, in some of the range areas is easy to access. It's, it will be easy to move because there's large open areas and then and, and contain it in one location. But we're gonna have to look at what methods we can do that and if that's feasible too, uh, depending on the volume of the soil. I mean, I think one thing to emphasize in, in, in Michelle's presentation earlier, she said that you know it was more widespread than we thought, but it was also shallower than we thought it could be. So um, that is one benefit. That there may be less of a volume of contaminated soil than we thought initially, but also since it's spread over such a wide area, um, that's gonna make a difference too. So we're really gonna need to evaluate that as we're looking at these remedial alternatives. Um, another alternative would be to cap the impacted soil and then do stormwater management. So just be cap certain areas, bring in clean fill and just cap certain areas. Um, and it may be better to do that in some locations because it would be too hard to move that dirt to the consolidated area. So we'll be looking at that and that might work for some of the vegetarian areas, but it's probably not feasible to, and it, and it won't be feasible. I mean, we say not likely here, but I, I know it won't be feasible to cap creek sediments and creek soils. That would be extremely expensive. So that's where we may need to look at some um, other, other ways to manage that, those creek areas or that creek area. Um, and then exposure controls. The, the, that's, this is gonna be the, one of the main things we'll be looking at for the remedial alternatives is making sure there's fence, fences and signage in certain areas and, and um, to make sure people can't access these, these areas of the club. Now, all of the remedial alternatives I just mentioned, the consolidated impacted cap area or the cap impacted soil or exposure controls and all those scenarios, we're gonna to need to continue with some level of stormwater management. Um, depending on you know, where those consolidated areas are, or um, how we manage the rest of the site, uh, we'll determine you know, what those controls need to be and, um, and how we need to manage. Because we, we basically, we can't, we, like, just for example, we couldn't cap the area, right in an area of stormwater drainage and have stormwater running over it and then pushing material off that cap or, or potentially undermining the cap and getting, uh, you know, mobilizing material that's uh, supposed to be segregated and isolated. So um, we'll have to make sure there's appropriate stormwater management so we don't mobilize areas that we're trying to uh, protect and, and, and from additional contamination. So, um, so this project schedule will be uh, to start later this year with this uh, in, in the environmental risk assessment um, work plan. And so uh, that will include the things I talked about, the human health risk analysis, the ecological risk assessment, and the feasibility study and remedial action plan. And so um, those things are expected to take the next year or so to, to conduct those studies, uh, but we are planning to kick them off um, this fall and winter uh, with approved, well, as, as soon as the water board approves our plans and, and we get our new contracts in place, we will uh, be kicking off those studies later this fall, early winter. Okay, so that's the end. I know we covered a lot of information and started really fast at the beginning. So I um, know there may be some questions um, to get to. So I'm happy to go back to any of the slides and I have some other slides um, if needed, if you have other questions. Okay, thank you very much. I that's um, very good news about uh, the uh, Green Valley Creek having not much and uh, therefore not affecting the 
Lake Chabot. Yeah. I would I would say of any of that, that's what really comes to mind. Um, but was, was there a surprise that there was so much lead in the forested area? Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's, you know, that's something that was a surprise. Um, and if that, so when we first started, I mean, when you go out there and you look at the ranges and where the targets were and where they shot, you would think, oh, there's, a, we knew there was an overshot area. And you go and you walk up the hillsides and you'll find the bullet fragments that Michelle showed us and, and other shot pellets and things. And so, you know, there's an overshot area, but the extent of that overshot area was very surprising. I mean, to get sitting up by the road, we were finding bullet fragments and things like that on the road leading, you know, that, that traverses the site uh, that, that people drive in on. So, I mean, it was, just, uh, you know, interesting to find those fragments in the soil up in those areas. Now, uh, any other things that were a surprise? Well, um, I wouldn't say it was a surprise, but I mean, it was very good news that it didn't get into groundwater. I think that was not something we assumed uh, because of the way the site, we knew it had been graded at some point and filled and a lot of fill had been added into that valley to create the flat surfaces for these ranges. So we knew there was a pretty good depth to groundwater, but we hadn't studied it. So, and we hadn't done any borings. And so we always had a concern about that. And so I think when we did the the, the wells and, and did the testing, it was very good to see that we didn't have an impact there because that would be very costly to remediate. Um, and I think it was just, we, I was surprised that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm also just, the, the, that it didn't get in farther into Grass Valley Creek and down to Lake Chabot was just a good confirmation, as you already noted. I think that's something we were happy to find. Uh, there was some concern about how much of impact there could have been in those, those creek areas. Um, there are some impacted areas closer to the range um, in, in, the, in the unnamed tributary that we'll have to really look at closely. Um, but that wasn't unexpected. So that was something we kind of knew about and um, were concerned about um, from the beginning. So um, they just did confirm. I think another concern that was good, good or area we're concerned about, and we haven't had any, found any issues yet, is around some of the buildings um, and some of the areas. And we've been told that there had been bullet, um, it's, I guess, smel melting of bullets and then reconstituting, like smelting uh, and basically melting down some of the bullets. And so we were concerned about some of the products that are used in doing that. A lot of times they use a lot of metal solvents to clean equipment, and a lot of those can be toxic um, in certain areas. So we did a lot. Of, we did testing for those constituents of concern around some of the buildings and surfaces, and we didn't find any of that. So that was also good news um, of, of, as far as the extent of the problem. But the the, the concerning part is there's the extent of the lead contamination in the large area. But um, but it, since some of those areas are lower concentrations, we may be able to use um, some alternate methods. But that's what we're going to have to really determine as we move forward with the ecological risk assessment. Uh, okay, uh, Colin, some comments or questions? Yeah, so what is the danger of the contamination in the overshot areas? Um, if, if it's not getting into groundwater or the local creeks, Yeah. It, 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 the, the danger of the contamination to uh, fauna and flora are, is what? Um, well, that's, I mean, that's what we're going to have to evaluate in this next ecological risk assessment. But I think the concern is if you have these small particles, um, they could be potentially ingestible by birds or something, you know, that's something that's pecking on the ground and not noticing what they're necessarily eating or eating for okay. an insect and they eat a small pellet of lead. Uh, I think that'll be the main concern. So it's mainly about ingestion, I think. Um, uh, would be the main concern about the lead particles themselves. Um, there is, and so I mean, that's what we're going to look at. I mean, there are also, there's a lot of lead in, in some of the trees, just in the trunks of the trees. Um, and so that's something we'll have to look at because those areas do need to be thinned in the future. So that may be more of a, a material management issue in the future. Um, but I think that's something we're concerned about um, just as far as we need to thin those trees. But as far as ecological risk, that won't create much risk because it's really in the trunk of that tree. It's not moving. Um, so it's really about the, the potential for organisms to ingest either the soil okay. contaminated or the lead particles that are the biggest concern. Um, but that's why we'll be we'll looking through this risk assessment to determine, you know, how possible that is in, in certain areas. Okay, my only, the other potential question, for that. Yes. my only other question was, what is it physically when you refer to a cap? What is the cap physically? Uh, well, there are a wide variety of, of options. I mean, it can, a, a cap can be just concrete, um, but uh, they're also, um, as similar at Point Isabel, there was a soil cap. So it was a clay cap, of about three feet of soil, of uh, uh, clay fill was placed um, over the areas at um, Point Isabel. So it's something like that is probably what we'll be leaning towards. 
but it really determines like on the volumes and the once we set up the cleanup standard determine like all the numbers uh, or the amount we have to the amount of soil that has to be cleaned up to get to those target cleanup numbers is really going to determine how big that area needs to be, how big the consolidated area is, and then will help us inform what should the cap should be um, constructed um, of. I mean, likely, I mean, I think we would probably want to go for the soil vegetated cap. It'll just look better. It'll be easier to construct, but um, we may, in some areas, may have to do some other uh, impervious surface of potentially concrete or other um, decomposed granite type material that can um, create a more sealed layer. Um, so we'll be um, just evaluating that with the consultants on what the options could be. Okay, thank you. Good presentation. Appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions. Um, we are going to plan to meet um, in the near future also um, with Director Waspy. This is in his ward. We want to keep him informed about what's been happening. Um, but, and so we will give him a, an update. Um, but you can expect to see several contracts coming to the board um, on consent. Um, in, in, in one of the next meetings um, in, in, on next steps for the, the next steps of the investigation. Um, and we'll also need to be talking to the board in the near future about um, just land uses, potential land uses for the site, um, because that will really inform our ecological risk assessment. So we're discussing that now with Sabrina and we'll be bringing that back to the board in the near future on um, just some of the land use considerations, because it re it's really gonna inform how we do the risk assessment for human health based on what the, the future use of the sites could be site could be. Yeah, well, I'm particularly interested in that because it is uh, a handsome site, you know, and, and to make the decision that, you know, we wouldn't do camping or picnic tables or anything like that, I, I think is something we'll really want to think about. And, and I'd certainly, um, the dentist to, um, Pay attention to that since he knows most of the, he knows the park so well. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really gonna. I mean, those things will really drive the the cost. You know, so so the more we want to have these like human uses, like of camping and so we have camping and picnicking, then we'd be looking at in that table I was showing the the human health standard and running to, or the Michelle reference earlier is it getting into a human health standard, a residential standard of cleanup. Um, and yeah. so that would be that we'd have to move the most soil and do the most consolidation to make it you know safe for full human use on a regular basis. Um, hiking through the area would be, you know, less risk and would re re require less remediation. Um, and if we were to use it for other more industrial uses of park operation and equipment storage, and people are there only a few times, a few hours a day or things like that, it would be a lower level of cleanup. So, um, and, and in cost. And so we'll have to balance those um, options just to determine what's the, the most feasible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. These are our our initial steps toward figuring out how much it's actually going to cost us. Yeah. And we have um, ha seen some pretty large figures for the remediation for sure. Yeah. And, and I, we're still thinking it's within those target numbers. I mean, I, I'm not going to say exactly now, but we're tens of millions is what we're looking at. Um, but I mean, it can be changed. I mean, it can be those costs can come down though, based on the, uh, the use of the site and then how we can consolidate those these materials. But I mean, but if you go back, I mean, if I don't, I, I'm not gonna put the presentation back up, but that one off hauling everything would be extremely expensive. I mean, that's, we say tens of millions, I and mean, it would push the limit of that, especially with the cost going up now for just moving materials and fuel costs. So um, there's gonna need, definitely need to be some level of consolidation on site because just to move everything that's contaminated off site would be virtually impossible. Really, really pricey. Yeah, extremely expensive. So, yeah. and, and there's also going to be significant staff time in managing this project. So, um, you know, we're, uh, you know, co coordinating now, I mean, in keeping design and construction informed, we'll be having someone from design and construction joining our uh, team as we move through this risk assessment process and get more towards the feasibility study and remedial action plan. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and we'll need ongoing support, um, financial support to implement the, you know, to staff the work and to uh, uh, implement the, the closure. Okay, so so definitely when you um, provide what the options are to the board, um, fold in that how much of existing staff uh, time it will take, because I think that's a um, very interesting element to it. Yeah, it definitely does have some several interesting elements. <laughs> Along with everything else. Um, Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you.
Matt, and um, thank our consultant too. You know, we we really got uh, talkative at, at this board meeting. Yeah, a lot of exciting topics. We, we, we just piled them all on today. Yeah, very interesting meeting. Uh, no, we all had very, Brenda had a great presentation and it was also Nature Check was another good stewardship item. So. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Sabrina, is there any public waiting to talk about this with us? There are no public comments at this time. No. All right, thank you. Um, and I'm assuming that refers to any general public comments. So now we're at board comments. And I do wanna thank you for the IPM report. No, always, always interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm always pleased that it looks uh, so fine <laughs> with, uh, with good graphics and a, a real, you know, the examples of case studies I thought were interesting too. Um, I did not find anything here that said um, who wrote the, you know, what staff were involved in writing it. Did I miss that when I was looking through? Um, it was written, it was uh, primarily the IPM staff uh, that mm -hmm. wrote the report and then we had big um, assistance from public affairs to help edit and make it more uh, reader friendly. Yeah, I, I, just, I just think uh, since these do last a while to, to say who, who did the research and writing and graphics is, in the document is, is a helpful thing. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll make that note for next year. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And is there anything anybody wants to say about this or were they going to talk to us more about it at some point? We did give the update um, at the April NCR. Okay. That basically covered the same material. So uh, we weren't planning on, on revisiting that unless there's a request to do so. Okay, and then this did, um, I think three of us got this at board yesterday. Uh, so if you would send it along with mail to the other four. Oh, okay, because they weren't in person at the meeting. Okay, uh, I will do that. Um, I'll, and, I'll coordinate with. Um, and, and Dennis was there part of the time, but I don't think he got one because he had to leave a little early. Okay, all right, thank you for letting me know. I'll, I'll follow okay. up with them. Um, I think Karen. they'd like to see that, so. Uh, okay, thank you. And do you have any comments, Colin? No, I just want to thank uh, all the folks that uh, put the meeting together. It's done very well, smooth. And I will certainly second that. And you don't often get a video, so that was kind of cool, uh, especially to see all those sites and the fact that Brenda has so little on her plate. All right, so thank you for everybody for helping with it and the committee meeting is adjourned. Bye-bye.